this event. I'm not going to formally welcome you yet because we still have people who are joining us in the room and you're all very welcome. So I'll just give you a few minutes because we're going to wait for more people to register and then we'll start. But just in the meantime, for those of you who are uh, joining us, you're very welcome. And again, as I said, I'll formally open proceedings and welcome you formally in just a few minutes. Um, for those of you who are participants, so registered to watch proceedings online, for the moment, you will see that your cameras are turned off and your microphones are muted. That is going to be the case automatically until we get to the discussion parts of today's workshop, which will be further down the agenda for parts four and parts five. And what we want to do to make sure that as many of you can participate as possible, what we will do for those elements is we're going to open up your cameras and your microphones and give you the ability to be able to speak directly through your video if that's what you want. Um, and so if what's going to be important for those elements is that you make sure your cameras, you have, you, you make sure your microphones are muted, your cameras are off because they will, they can automatically be turned on if you so wish. Um, but we really would only like those of you who would like, want to speak to us directly to do so. So please make sure that for those elements, you keep an eye on your camera, make sure that your mic is muted, your camera is turned off. But then if you would like to speak to us directly through your video for those elements, what I would suggest is if you can indicate to me in the a chat box by pressing the raise your hand icon and I will be able to watch on my stream here those of you participating who would actually like to speak to us physically and um, so the best way to let me know that you would like to do that is to press the hand icon on your screen and I'll be checking out then and I'll be able to see that you will you would like to speak to us directly and that would be brilliant Obviously, the main thing to make sure is that your connection is good, um, that your microphone is good so that we can hear you and that we can see you clearly. Again, I'll go through that in more detail once we come to those segments. We'll probably just start now. I think that we have um, a good number of participants who have been joining us. So what I will do now then is say hello everybody um, you're all very welcome to this policies for circular design workshop hosted by the eu and the indonesian chamber of commerce and industry this is of course the second of these workshops with the first on textiles taking place yesterday my name is karen coleman i am a journalist and a broadcaster from ireland i specialize in european and international issues and i have the pleasure of moderating this workshop and i cover a wide range of issues in my work as an editorial journalist from politics and environmental issues to the war in ukraine and indeed also on issues to do with circular economy it's great to see so many of you registered and participating in today's workshop and indeed in yesterday's one as well. I hope you get a lot out of today's event. And as I said earlier, when I was talking with you just a few minutes ago, you will see that the two main interactive parts of today's workshop are the two discussion elements, parts four and parts five. We'd love to get as many of your views and comments during those two elements in particular. So if you would like to ask a question or submit a view, can you please do it through the chat box on your WebEx platform? We're not going to use the Q&A element because using the two is just going to get a little bit confusing. So if you'd like to put a question or raise a comment or make a comment, please put it through the chat box. Um, if as I said earlier, you would like to actually physically appear on screen, then the way to do that is press the hand icon on your screen. Then I will be able to see that you have your hand raised and then I will go to you. Obviously, please make sure that you have a good connection 
before you do that so we can hear you and we can see you um, perfectly. And of course, for those who are speaking on panels, then your microphones and your cameras should be should come on automatically once you are participating in your panel debate. To get the most, I think, out of the screen, your, your screen interaction, then I think the best thing for you is to put your screen on full screen. You'll do that by going to looking at the viewing element on the top right hand corner of your screen. So I would suggest that maybe the best recommendation is for you to choose the full screen. Um, again, you will hear, as I said, a number of individual speakers to begin with, and then we will have the two different workshops as well. Um, on the privacy statements, you should all have had access to the privacy statement that's relevant for this event. Please ensure you have read it and you understand it. Now, as you see, we have a very busy agenda. It's packed with lots of different, very interesting themes and speakers and panel discussions. So let's get started. And we're going to begin now with some opening remarks from two speakers. And I'd like to call on our first speaker now, Luca Marmo is a senior expert on external relations and G7, G20 coordinator at the Environment Directorate General of the European Commission. Luca, you are very welcome. I'm going to hand over to you now to formally open today's workshop. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are connected to today's workshop, particularly those of you in the Americas uh, who have had to wake up early and those of you who are connected from uh, Asia, uh, East Asia, where it starts to be late in the day, including our co-hosts in Indonesia. Uh, this workshop uh, is in support of the G20 Resource Efficiency Dialogue. Uh, it's co-organized by the European Union and CADIN, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and, and Industry. It is often mentioned that up to 80% of the environmental impacts of a product can be addressed in the design phase. This includes aspects related to material and energy efficiency that are also in the producer interests. So the role of industry uh, and businesses in general is fundamental. Hence our partnership with Cadin today. Uh, last year, the G20 environment uh, ministers set out a vision for driving forward actions on sustainable consumption and production including through resource efficiency and circular economy. Aspects related to circular product design, including longevity, repair, reuse and recycling, were also explicitly mentioned in the minister's communique. And this is an air work that the G20 resource efficiency dialogue has included in its roadmap 2021-2023. And today's workshop is a contribution from our side towards that commitment. And we are very pleased that Cadin has accepted to co-organize the workshop with us, showing the interest that the Business 20 pay to circular approaches that contribute to sustainability goals including uh, Sustainable Development Goals 12, which is about sustainable consumption and production, and SDG 9, which is about inclusive and sustainable industrialization. Uh, the EU has a success story, we think, in setting environmental rules uh, for products and sectors. A relevant example are the requirements uh, on energy-related products. These rules are responsible for huge energy efficiency gains, which is good news not only for the environment, but also for our pockets. Uh, last year alone, eco-design requirements saved the European consumers some 120 billion euros. And this money not spent on energy also counts as money 
which we did not send out of our countries to the benefit of foreign regimes or companies. And if we continue to deliver on existing policies while taking some newer ones forward, which I will mention shortly, by 2030, we estimate we can make energy savings equivalent to the EU's current imports of Russian gas, which is an important uh, uh, achievement given the current geopolitical situation. So uh, the European Commission on the 30th of March adopted uh, a package of initiatives uh, on making sustainable products uh, uh, the norm. Uh, we want to go beyond energy efficiency uh, and we think that uh, circularity works uh, not only for the planet, uh, but also for decreasing our dependence uh, and for the well-being of, of people in general. A centerpiece of uh, the package of proposals that the European Commission presented in March is a new legislative proposal to extend uh, our eco-design approach, our eco-design legislation uh, to a broad range of physical goods and include uh, material efficiency aspects, resource efficiency aspects, design aspects. So once uh, agreed by the co-legislators, the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, the future rules will make products last longer, make them cheaper to repair, as well as more energy and resource efficient. Uh, and as I said, all these will also translate in consumer savings. I will not go further into this package because uh, Matthias Magai uh, will intervene later, specifically detailing you the, the, full, uh, the full spectrum of the EU proposals. So without further ado, I wish uh, everyone a fruitful workshop. And I think I give the floor to uh, Mr. Oscar Ungul, the vice chairman of Kadin, whom I had the pleasure to meet uh, in person in Jakarta uh, in March uh, on the sides of a G20 meeting. So, Onte, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. I may um, uh, just intervene here, but thank you very much for that. And as you said, of course, um, we will have further insights into the EU sustainable products initiatives. I believe we may have had a, a change in the agenda. And if I'm correct, um, Basri Kanba, are we now joined by you? Is it uh, Basri who is joining us? Basri, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So just to say that, as I said, we have had a change of agenda and now our second speaker is Basri Kamba, who is the chair of the Waste Management and Circularity Committee at Kadin, of course, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He is also the director of Asia Pacific Rayon and chairman of Indonesia's first sustainable fashion alliance, that's Rantai Textile Lestari RTL. Mr. Kamba, you are very welcome. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you so much, Karen. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to this workshop on behalf of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, it's an association of business organization in Indonesia. The 12,000 members of this chamber consist of entrepreneurs or combination of national businesses from various sectors both privately owned and cooperatives. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening from Jakarta. So let me start from here. In Indonesia, judging from the existing legal framework regulating the waste management, the circular economy is actually no longer a voluntary. It's no longer something nice to have. Why? Because we have a national roadmap for zero waste and we know we cannot achieve this without a circular economy. For example, we have a 
2017 government regulations number 97 on national strategic policy uh, is actually a roadmap for the 2025 Indonesia's zero waste. The regu this regulation aims to improving the management and reduction of domestic waste and domestic waste equivalents. The target is very straightforward. 30% uh, reduction of waste production and then processing 70% of the waste in 2025. Furthermore, the Minister of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry issued in 2019 the Ministerial Decree number 75 is actually also the roadmap of waste reduction by producers. This is key element or key pillar in the Indonesian's commitment for circular economy using the concept of the EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, or even beyond that. So to achieve all these policy goals, our question may be like this. Can Indonesia establish a circular economy? For me, for us in Kadin, rather than questioning it, we need to act, whatever the scale is. It is a must, following our climate change commitment for the net zero emission. Then uh, for those who ask what circular economy is, it is the way to keep valuable products and materials in use rather than wasting them. We can already find it in Indonesia for many decades, even uh, before this terminolo terminology circular economy. I give you some at least three examples. In the old Indonesia, a new baby boy or baby girl until today, most likely they are going to reuse clothes or items from his or her elder siblings. Today, if you're traveling around Indonesia, you still see this kind of local practices. Then, uh, second example, women in most villages and towns across Indonesia still use the traditional mat basket to the markets. So this is actually, they can reduce the use of plastic bags. The third example is actually uh, that we can still see today that wedding outfits are actually being rented from some uh, agencies uh, in many villages and towns. Ladies and gentlemen, according to McKinsey, the circular economy represents a net materials cost saving. So again, we are businesses, right? So it, we are talking about cost savings. So according to the McKinsey, the circular economy represents a net material cost savings opportunity of 350 to 380 billion in the EU automotive and other transport sectors. I think in Asia, you know, it's almost uh, that big uh, as well. And the benefits of a circular economy in the future will bring this our commitment, you know, will bring the potential positive outcomes on the threat balance, the greenhouse gas emissions reductions, efficiency of our businesses, effective use of resources, and better security of supply, as already mentioned earlier by Luca. And we know that we cannot economically achieve these waste targets and the other climate and environmental needs unless products are designed for circularity so that they are more durable, do not quickly end up as waste in needing treatment or leaking into the oceans. So when they must be recycled, they have enough value to be economically recycled and an economy grows around recycling. When everyone is transitioning from linear to circular, all business process and all policies should be built and based on a circular economy approach. And with the advance of technology, and more practical business cases that we can learn also from today's workshop, it's good and advantages for the business, including those in Indonesia. So, Kadin and I personally are very happy to welcome you to this workshop so we can all understand better how important product design is to make the circular economy work as an economy and to exchange with each other 
on which policies can support circular design of products. Stakeholders cannot work in silo, in isolation. International supports are more than welcome with openness and transparency because for us, it's time to act. It's time to collaborate. I wish a fruitful workshop to all participants and speakers. Again, thank you for the EU to work with us, Kadin, to have these two workshops, yesterday workshops and today's workshops. Thank you and back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamba, for those introductory remarks and indeed for setting out the benefits of the circular economy, what they may entail. You mentioned the renting of wedding outfits. Indeed, that's happening in my own country in Ireland and many other countries as well. And as you say, establishing a circular economy is a must in your own words. Thank you very much. You can turn off your camera and uh, mute your microphone now. Thank you so much uh, for that. By the way, a very big warm welcome to those of you who have been joining us since we started. I can see many, many more participants have been coming in online. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I know you're coming in from all parts of the world. It's great to see so many of you joining us. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I have the pleasure of facilitating this workshop. I specialize in EU issues, EU issues and touch on environmental issues and indeed circular economy issues every now and again in my work. So now it's time for our first segment, which will focus on the summary of trends in environmental problems, economic loss and social harm, including greenhouse gas emissions, from the vast volumes of waste products that are out there. And to make this presentation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome now to Elisa Tanda, the Head of Consumption and Production Unit at the UN's Environment Programme and the organisational focal point as well for the circular economy. Elisa, you are most uh, welcome and I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Karen, and a very deep thank to the organizer, the EU and uh, uh, Kadim, for having invited uh, UNEP to be part of this very interesting conversation. And thanks again for the colleagues who have been putting the slides on the screen. What I'm Elisa, I think your microphone has uh, gone down. Would you mind putting it on again? It's Karen here. Can you just check? I can't hear you now. Can others hear you just in case this is an issue? Um, can you just talk again, Elisa? Talk to uh, count up to five and let's see if we can get your mic going there. I can also not hear. Please. Okay, so I'm getting um, more feedback from the crew that we can't hear you, Elisa. Um, so can you just check your settings, please, and let's see if we can get your microphone sorted. So just check your settings there now and see yeah. if you can get Karen, it. Yes. can we try again? Yes, is I that Elisa? No. Yes, I, we can hear you now, excellent. Super, excellent. So that was an easy fix. <laughs> and uh, what I was uh, alluding to is that what I'm going to touch upon during this initial intervention is really to focus on and zoom in the purpose of circular design because ultimately the conversation that we will be having today is very much around how do we uh, design materials products and overall our system and our infrastructure in such a way that we really take into account the full spectrum of impacts uh, of the context in which we are operating and we really are aiming at designing out waste and pollution, but also understanding the trade-offs and consequences uh, of our initiatives and actions. And if we can move to the first slide, uh, that's going to just give a flavor of the context that we will be focusing on. And we will be really looking into the, uh, the three system, the three value chain that I understand have been the focus of your conversation yesterday and will be the focus of your conversation today. Understanding how in the electronics, plastics and textile value chain for the whole spectrum of operation that are happening into that value chain, we are actually in need of resource input 
and how that system, those operations are responsible for environmental impacts as well as socioeconomic impact. And what I'll try to do when quickly skimming through those value chain will be giving you a flavor of, uh, let's say, what's our current picture in terms of uh, impacts of the sector, but also give you a flavor of what would be the trends of these impacts, of these uh, consequences on uh, uh, the environment, but also on our society and our economic, if we do not transform the trends of our economic activities. And if we could move to the next slide, we're just going to dive deeply into one of those value chains, which is the electronics one. And you'll see on this slide a snapshot of the impact I will be referring to when looking specifically at the electronic value chain. We are obviously all well aware that this is one of the sector that uh, has been uh, accounted for as one of the top eight sector uh, accounting for carbon emission and that uh, electronic uh, products are frequently referred to as products that are really deeply energy intensive, particularly in their use phase. Um, and that they are therefore an important contributor to greenhouse gas emission. When we're talking about uh, electronic uh, product, electric product, including uh, electric vehicles, there's always one aspect that comes to our mind, which is where a lot of the resources needed for this product are coming from. And this leads us to understanding again in the full uh, value chain that um, whatever is related to electronic sector is also closely linked to mining activities as well and the implications both in terms of pollution and in terms of impact of nature that those activities are responsible for. Um, we also are aware that a number of products that are used in the electronic sector across uh, the full production cycle um, may be uh, impactful on the individuals, on workers that are exposed to them, as well as they might have consequences on the communities or the population that are uh, in the uh, adjacent areas of the production facilities. And uh, it's also very clear that for some of these uh, minerals and metals that are part of electronic equipment, we might also want to be uh, careful of uh, the full uh, traceability and origin of those material because in a number of instances they might come from either conflict areas or they might come from areas with very fragile environment or um, that might be in uh, situations where there might be um, uh, there might be a need to strengthen the opportunity of uh, the governance of those resources. If we could move to the next slide, uh, that slide is just going to give us a sense of how those impact would differ, differ according to the different electronic product uh, that we might be considering in our conversation today and in which stage of uh, the value chain they would appear. I'm not going to go in depth in those uh, different products and where those impacts will materialize, but that's definitely important when we're thinking about design of really being clear of which are the impacts that we're going to address and where they materialize. And if we could quickly move to the following slide, that is intended to give you a gist of uh, the trends that we are uh, experiencing. And I'm sure we are all well aware that the purchase of electronic products as well as electric vehicles as is expected to double uh, from the levels of 2020-2015 when compared with the levels we would expect in 2045-2050. And this clearly implies if we're looking at the minerals and metals that are part of this product, a very significant increase in the need of uh, resources that would go into those products. And just to mention, a very frequently referred to 
uh, figure associated with the demand of lithium and cobalt. We're actually expecting that demand to grow by a factor that might range between 10 to more than um, 20, um, specifically if we're accounting for the need of future hybrid electric car purchases. Uh, and we're also are well aware, and that's the very last image that you see on the screen, that the currently recycling rates of a number of these uh, minerals and metals are still particularly limited. So our pressure on the, on the environment and on natural resources is very high, as we're not good at keeping those resources in our economy as long as possible. If we could move to the next slide, that's going to give us a snapshot of another value chain that I understand will be part of your conversation. I understand today you will be concentrating the discussion on plastic packaging. And that image reflects a, a overview of a number of aspects that really cover not only the environmental dimension, but as we alluded to at the beginning of the uh, conversation, how our decision around design might impact also our society and our economy. I'm sure we're all well familiar with a lot of the figures uh, that reflect what would be the consequences in terms of plastic waste entering the environment if we continue with a business as usual scenario, with plastic waste almost tripling between 2016 and 2040. Um, and we also know that uh, a number of plastic products are also containing chemical additives. Uh, we're also aware that for specific products, um, we have microplastic contained in them, or microplastic might uh, be the ori originated by the degradation of macroplastics, and that has been um, uh, associated with evidence of harm to human, wildlife, and the environment, as well as a limitation in terms of the conversation that we're having today of keeping resources as long as possible in the economy and in a safe uh, context. Um, <clears throat> um, reference could also be made to the implications on uh, climate change and life cycle plastic related greenhouse gas emission are actually projected if we continue with the current trends from the current 3% to a potential 90% by 2040. Um, I'm sure you're also all well familiar with the economic loss that we are confronted with by not bringing plastic uh, packaging material back into the economy. And our colleagues who will uh, follow me later in the session from the Alec MacArthur Foundation are referring to uh, figures uh, between 80 and 120 billion annually lost to the economy. Uh, there's also job opportunities that are missed, particularly in middle and low income countries, where there are high potentials of closing the material loop with new innovative and safe employment opportunity, unless we move to a more circular economy scenario. Um, we also know, and I'll just be reflecting on uh, one of the additional figures that is here in this slide, that uh, out of uh, the plastic waste that is imported in the emerging economy, a significant majority has actually very limited market value. And therefore, the destiny that they may have is uh, mainly for them to be in landfill and in uh, open dams or uh, burned. And if we can move to the next slide, this is again a bit of a visual snapshot of uh, uh, where those uh, impacts are materializing across the plastic life cycle, which are the different stakeholders that are involved in uh, those different stages of the life cycle. And the arrows that are represented are really intended to show where the loops can be closed by a circular design of the system. So in this sense, uh, that's again where we are associating uh, the impacts and the consequences from the current model to the opportunities that can be uh, drawn upon uh, by bringing circularity into that system. And if we can move to the following slide, I'll uh, uh, move through the last value chain that I understand was part of your conversation yesterday, the, the textile, the fashion value chain. 
where um, I'm sure your conversation has been reflecting on the uh, significant growth on production in clothing, accompanied by the fact that the garments that we're purchasing are worn less and less, and that very few of these garments, less than 1%, are actually recycled at the same level of uh, value of resources, meaning that in a number of instances, their destiny is actually downcycling. This is also speaking to a, a decree of a loss of value in the economy uh, due to underutilization of the products that are entering into our economy. Uh, you might find in different researches and in different publications slightly different figures in relation to the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the sector. And the figures you would likely find are uh, for that sector to be accounting between 2 and 8% of the world greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, again, understanding what are the potential of reduction of uh, impact from that sector. You'll see references to water consumption of the sector. And at the very end of the slide, you will also see that the sector is consuming uh, significant amounts of chemicals, both at the phase of use of uh, pesticides and fertilizers in cotton cultivation, but also throughout textile production, with an important number of these chemicals also being hazardous to human health. And I'm sure we are all well familiar with the interlinkages that exist between the sector and the value chain we uh, alluded to before, um, due to the release of microplastics uh, that uh, emerge during the washing phase uh, of textile product. If we could move to the next slide, it will give us a snapshot of where across the value chain the sectors that we have been alluding to would mainly um, uh, be experienced. Again, a consideration to keep in mind when we are designing with an intention of minimizing those impact while acknowledging what might be the consequences of uh, uh, our efforts. And if we can move to the next slide, uh, it will give a sense of uh, what are the impacts beyond the environmental aspects, also looking into the social econ socioeconomic implications of the sector as it is, meaning in the snapshot that we're having today. And you'll see references to uh, the uh, risks associated with the health damages, particularly in terms of uh, occupational illnesses as well as uh, the risks that are associated uh, for workers along different stages of the production line. Um, one element that uh, it's also important to take into account is that um, while reuse of clothes shows positive environmental impact, what might be very interesting for us to discuss in the course of the day is what are the implications for um, such products to be at the end of their first life to be exported to new markets and potentially posing a risk to the local uh, textile producers. If we can move to my very last slide, uh, I'll just touch upon trends for this sector as well. And you'll see a reference in this slide on how the sector would um, evolve over time if uh, the trends that we have been referring to in the earlier slide will continue over time. And obviously, um, there is a very clear projection of an increase in demand from this for this sector, an increase that might reach the percentage of 63%, particularly in emerging markets, and that percentage being reached over the next decade. A lot of that growth in the request from uh, from that mark from this sector are actually coming from uh, the two to three billion new middle class consumer expected by 2050 uh, in a number of emerging markets. You are also seeing from the visual on the screen that this also speaks a lot to the growing opportunity that this sector has found on the basis of the e-commerce. But I want to also conclude with a positive note 
that we're seeing, and I'm, I'm sure you are seeing as well, a lot of increase in awareness from uh, um, uh, consumers and particularly the younger generation of consumers of the new opportunities associated to closed um, loop business models uh, that are emerging and particularly towards the resale market that it is expected actually to grow 11 times faster uh, by 2025 and therefore attracting uh, a lot of opportunities again to close material loops into the system. And the very, very last slide will show on the screen with the, my contacts. And Karen, I'm handing the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank you so much for that. And indeed, you covered a lot uh, during your presentation, just very quickly uh, talking about the need um, for increasing circular design and, and, and getting rid of waste pollution and some strong um, issues that you raised there in your slides particularly the issue about resources and where minerals and metals come from uh, for these products. And we need to be more mindful of that and the fact that they can have lots of consequences from health to conflicts, to traceability, et cetera. And then some interesting points between 2016 to 2040, plastic waste almost tripling, which is just a staggering figure and less than 10% of plastics are recycled globally. Um, and also, of course, ending nicely there with the challenges and solutions, some solutions for ridding us of this plastic pollution and the opportunities as well, including for those in the textile sector. Uh, very comprehensive, Elisa, thank you very much for that. Again, a warm welcome to those of you who have joined us over the last few minutes. You're very welcome to this workshop on circular design. Now, of course, from Elisa's presentation, we heard a lot there about the extensive problems, economic, social and other, that are caused by the massive volumes of waste from products. So how can we influence product design to reduce those kinds and levels of toxic waste. That's the theme of our next segment. We're going to hear more about how product design can cause waste, what can be done to improve product design to reduce this kind of waste. And we'll also hear about some examples of modern products that are designed for the likes of durability, reuse, repair and recycling, etc. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker for this segment, Joe Ellis, the Circular Design Programme Lead at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's, of course, I'm sure you know well, a charity that works globally to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And Joe's role is to inspire and equip the world's designers and creative professionals to help build a more circular economy. Joe, you're very welcome. We're dying to hear what you have to say now about improving circular design and all the wonderful stuff that the foundation is doing. I'm going to hand over to you now. You're very welcome. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully our testing of this all worked beautifully and you can see the slide in front of you. Um, yeah, thank you, Karen, and thank you to the European Commission and Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry for hosting this workshop on such an important topic and one that's close to my heart. I'm not actually a product designer myself, but have always been fascinated by the things that we make and use, why some things stay in the economy providing value and why some things end up as waste. And what you see on the screen now is one of many uh, snapshots that I've taken from when I'm walking my dog around my neighbourhood in the UK, it really intrigues me why things stop being used, not just through physical defects, but really a bigger issue of where no, no one, no player in the system is willing or able to make use of things that were once considered valuable. So how do things that we once valued uh, become seen as waste or become seen as, as worthless? And in a more official capacity at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we've really been studying this for the past decade with a particular focus, as you've heard uh, uh, from Elisa, um, on plastic packaging, fashion and food. And the way we see it is that everything around us is designed. What we wear, the homes that we live in, the systems that bring us food, mobility, medicine or energy, 
And it's abundantly clear that our design de decisions have a big impact. They contribute to a linear use of materials and energy in pretty much every major industry, creating large volumes of waste and pollution and other negative impacts. So some of the, the statistics that you see on the screen at the moment uh, have been referenced already um, that, that around 50% of all plastics are single use, around 60% of clothing is landfilled or burnt within years of being made, and around a third of edible food is thrown away. We know that ha that has a, a significant economic loss, um, as referenced by Mr. Camber earlier on today. Um, a, a large contribution to, contribution to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and other uh, issues as well, such as the health costs of uh, improper um, uh, and linear uh, food production, um, which uh, are, are, do drive a significant economic cost as well. And if we connect this to really the, the biggest challenge of our time to climate, then we see that we really cannot fix our climate unless we fix our economy. And this does go deeper than renewables and energy efficiency. They're hugely important, as we know. They could provide 90% of uh, energy related emissions reduction by 2050. And the cost of generating renewable energy uh, is now lower than fossil fuel alternatives in many cases. But that alone is not enough if we're to meet our climate targets by 2050. And this is really the rest of the picture that you see on the screen at the moment. Nearly half of the emissions that cause climate change come from how we make and use products and food and how we manage our land. And for, for, for those areas, we need a different approach, uh, a different approach to the way that we handle this part of the economy, as it's clearly a major contributor to emissions. So waste and disposability are, in effect, woven into today's economy. They fuel climate change and limit opportunities for long term prosperity. And that's where a circular economy comes in. Circular economy plays a critical role in tackling many of those greenhouse gas emissions by changing the way that we design, make and use products and food. And this is kind of the macro picture and you can see the three principles of a circular economy uh, on the right hand side of this, uh, this slide to design out waste and pollution, to circulate products and materials, to keep them in use for longer and to regenerate nature. Uh, but I feel the, the macro picture has been covered uh, in, in, in some really useful detail uh, by Elisa in the previous presentation. What I hope to share with you today is, is a bit more of the, the, the practical aspects of circular design. And we know that design is influential. It can lead to new innovations at the product, service and system level. It's been design and designers have been doing that for years. But we believe it's the upstream decisions that are particularly important to shift from, a, from linear to circular. And that downstream measures need to be designed to match those. So this also supports the, the, the downstream measures, these upstream interventions, as we'll not be able to only recycle our way out of the waste, climate and biodiversity crisis. We need to do much more than that. So really, when we talk about upstream innovation, and the role of design, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we're really talking about treating the root cause of, of waste and pollution, of biodiversity loss, of, of, of climate change, rather than just tr trying to treat the symptoms. And then how do design decisions contribute to waste and pollution? Let's put ourselves perhaps in the shoes of a designer practicing today. How do their I have never met a designer who willfully wants to contribute towards a wasteful linear economy, but let's explore how that might uh, how how that's unfolded. Well, many of the design decisions that we see today that are evidenced in the the products and services around us, they're kind of ideal or at least unsurprising in today's linear economy. Today's economy is for the most part highly optimized. The intent of the system that we've designed over the past few hundred years is often uh, short time scales, low cost and uh, increasing access. And that has provided a uh, benefit to billions of people uh, around the world and throughout history. And but this linear model was established in the context of the Industrial Revolution in which we we've treated materials and energy as if they were limitless and we failed to design for post-use. We forgot about, about the waste and pollution and other externalities. 
But these design decisions, if we don't change them, if we don't change those up, those upstream uh, considerations, what we see is that when we try to bend this line into a circle, we're met with a number of obstacles. And what I mean by that is that if we try and build in circular circularity, if you if you want, uh, without considering this at the design stage, we'll we'll encounter some linear lock-in. So companies that might want to uh, set up a a reverse loop for one of their products might find that there's a lack of information about the, the product, the materials within it, its status. The reverse logistics might be unfamiliar and undeveloped, certainly compared to the optimized outward supply chains. The repair process for a product might be really manual and hands-on and really expensive. And there's very little optimization that's gone into that reverse loop. So it's kind of unsurprising that it hasn't happened, uh, that transition hasn't happened at the speed that we, we clearly need. And now let's look at the a hypothetical example of a washing machine, just to really work this through. If by intention you wanted that product to stay in use for longer, there'd be a whole list of considerations for that return loop if you, if you were intending to design for a circular model. You might be considering spare parts, their availability and where they're kept or how they're made. You might be considering a more durable uh, material selection, increased product information. You'd need to build those in at the design stage. So in the next few minutes of this presentation, I'm going to highlight some of the main design choices uh, that, that can influence whether a product, not just a washing machine, but, but any of the products that we make and use and uh, fill our homes and offices and our built world today, how those can be created, designed for a linear or a circular economy. And this absolutely is... Um, Joe, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's yeah. Karen here, uh, Joe. Just to say, we are under a little time pressure. So okay. if you can flow uh, quite quickly <laughs> through your slides, that would be great. Of Thanks course. a million. Yeah. So okay. this, isn't, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I'll give you a brief overview of some of the uh, design considerations. Firstly, material selection. Everything's made from um, something. Uh, in a circular economy, materials should increasingly come from renewable and regenerative sources, and the design decisions that, that designers make today can influence th that. So if materials are mixed up, if they're considered low value, if they're from finite sources, they can often be lost and cause waste and pollution. So really, we should be aiming for a bio-based and a smaller palette of materials that can easily be separated and, and improving the, the, the likelihood of their, their circulation or their, their um, diminishing their um, pollution uh, potential. You might look at something like Nopla, which is a, a edible single serve sachet in a way uh, made from seaweed, which can never become waste. Uh, or at the Adidas Future Craft Loop, a running shoe made from just one material rather than the many materials in uh, uh, running shoes today. Um, secondly, you could look at design choices, uh, the, how we make things, the, how, we, how we bind together the different materials in our, in our products. Designers could choose between many options, but main, maybe glue, um, uh, clip uh, fastenings, proprietary screws or standardized screws. And that could be the difference between whether a product is repaired or upgraded compared with one that cannot or where it's too expensive to uh, recapture and repair that product. I noticed Carl Weens is on the call from iFixit. iFixit have done an amazing job of putting this on the agenda of designers uh, and, and um, that we see those trends coming through a bit more frequently with things like the framework laptop. Uh, what about um, the changing needs or, or lifestyle changes for, uh, for, for products? Does your design accommodate this? Uh, that might be hard to imagine for some, pro some electronic products, although it is happening, but for something like furniture and the example of the sofa for life, it could be as simple as providing disassembly instructions, not just assembly instructions, but disassembly instructions. So an item, item can be taken apart, for example, when someone moves house, or it can be modular so they can ex expand their piece of furniture to meet their needs. And then uh, technology and uh, tracking technology is particularly is becoming a factor. Um, tracking the performance of an asset while it's in use can enable predictive maintenance, help, understand, help uh, manufacturers understand the flow of assets so that they could develop more sophisticated, predictable reverse supply chains. That's happening, for example, with Caterpillar and their product link uh, equipment. And all these design choices are really important, but alone they're not enough. 
So there, there aren't any circular products without consideration of the business model in which, which they fit. So even a product that is beautiful, repairable, durable, might fall into a linear pathway if there's no business model that keeps it in use. So Algramo, the, um, the, a business model from Latin America, is more than just a refillable bottle for cleaning products. It's a business model that enables people to refill their packaging. And Bosch make repairable washing machines, but the Papillon project is a pilot to provide that as a service. So Bosch are incentivized to keep that product in use for longer and not let it reach uh, the point of, of waste. And that, that should all emphasize the role of uh, the, the, the wider context. So circular design, there's not one size fix, fits all, but designing for different customers, different markets, different infrastructure may lead to different outcomes. And that's okay, uh, providing a product fits within the system and, and supports uh, the principles of a circular economy. I'm just gonna skip through a little bit now. Um, because I've covered some of the uh, physical considerations uh, that, that may come to mind when we think about circular design. But the point I really want to, to drive home is that these need to fit within a, a supportive business model and a broader context. So circular design is a creative process. It's not a checklist or a set of minimum requirements. And that's really why we see designers and creatives are, are engaged with it. And that, that influences design at the product, the service, and the system level. Um, and as designers, we, we really encourage designers to find points of intervention at those different areas. So if you look at a bike, for example, um, a bike as a product might be about delivering the best user experience. So a product can, that bike can be kept in use for as long as possible. How, does, how can policy inform how those, material, how, how those material decisions, those design decisions are, are made? But then we can look at bike as a service. Would a bike be owned? Uh, or how do you ensure that bike repair skills and repair businesses are thriving, supporting that those type of behaviors? And then looking at the wider system, how can we be thinking at an urban design level about designing transport systems to support bike use? And what kind type of urban plan design are, are we using? So the real magic happens with circular design when we're innovating at those different levels and how the insights from designers and policymakers come together to create this uh, systemic shift to a circular economy. So that was a very speedy uh, run through some of the uh, aspects of circular design as we see them at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Hopefully that's given something of an impression that circular design is a compelling frontier of innovation. But I believe in the next section, we'll be talking about why it's not happening at scale. Uh, why isn't it the default way of designing products? Uh, and I believe I'll be speaking with uh, Phillips and Unilever to um, to explore that. Great stuff, Joe. Thank you very much for that. I won't uh, go back over some of the main points you've made because I think they're perfectly clear. Really, really good. Appreciate you moving on with your slides because uh, we are under time constraints. And as you say, you're going to be uh, delving a little bit deeper now into understanding the choices and the influence, what influences designers as well. So I'm going to hand over to you because this segment is going to be moderated by Joe. So Joe is going to introduce his guests for this segment. And then Joe, when you finish, you can just hand back to me and I'll jump in. You have, according to the agenda, 20 minutes for this segment. So uh, we are running behind us. My clock says that it's 12.58. That's Central European time right now. So you've 20 minutes from now for your segment. OK, Wonderful. thanks a million, Joe. Watch the clock. Stuff. OK. Um, Thanks, Karen. So uh, I should have uh, Linda Yander-Old, uh, Director of Eco-Design and Sustainability at Philips, joining me now, uh, along with Jesus Asa, Global Food and Retail Sustainable Packaging Lead, and Jamie Bates, Global Design Leader at Unilever. Hello, folks. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. Oh, well, I'm really happy to be able to um, dive into this because uh, Obviously, what I'm sharing from the circular economy, the foundation's perspective is based in a sort of overview and, and some somewhat theoretical, of course, but based on connection with companies like yours. But it'd be good to get the sense of what you're trying to achieve in your company. So first off, um, I'd love to hear what environmental uh, uh, outcomes you're trying to achieve in your design teams um, based on 
uh, this broader conversation around circular economy. And uh, Linda, Jan, should we start with you on that one? Yeah, I'm fine, and and thank you, indeed, very much for the invitation today. And be here. Let me let me first start in uh, uh, talking. About what is the primary objective that we as a company have? Uh, it may be good to know. Philips is a a what we call ourselves a healthcare company. So we want to have innovation that really matters. So improve the lives, protect the lives. So the devices that we put, you know, are there, for example, to detect cancer. Uh, products need to be reliable, reliable, need to be safe to use, compliant, you know, with all these medical regulations, etc. Um, and then if you look at the sustainability point of view, uh, we are looking at the total environmental picture that the products that we have, and then indeed in both the services and the systems that we are in. Um, the way we look at our devices, we have actually made a split. And we call that uh, what we call the eco design focal area. So we're looking at energy, we're looking at the chemical substances, also referred to earlier uh, in, in the presentation from UNEP. We're looking at the packaging, but also at about the circular design. And the circular design, you could look at low weight designs, uh, repairability, recyclability. Um, and the leading principles are actually uh, twofold. Uh, we are one of the first companies who teamed up with the Ella MacArthur Foundation who really embracing the circular economy, but also Philips has committed to uh, science-based targets, so the 1.5 degrees. And these are actually leading in the design uh, um, and trying to contribute with what we put on the market uh, in line with these ambitions of, uh, of circular economy and the global warming. Okay. Um, so getting a sense of that that uh, the connection of the design approach to that that bigger transformation for the organization. And uh, what about Jesus and Jamie at Unilever? what what outcomes are you trying to achieve with with your with your design teams? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so. Uh, and of course, there are some similarities there, but I guess uh, we need to start that uh, mentioning that over the last decade, serious demands have been made of companies like Unilever. Uh, to deal with the problem of plastic waste, uh, and this is this is the right thing to do, but, but because it also drives innovation and it reflects changes in, in the consumer preference. So we in Unilever we have pledged uh, ambitious commitments for uh, waste free world. Uh, we uh, have committed to half the amount of built-in plastic that we use in our packaging and achieve an absolute reduction of more than 100,000 tons. Uh, we will as well use 25% recycled plastic in our packaging. And we will collect and process more plastic packaging than the one that we sell. And we are also ensure that 100% of the plastic packaging is designed to be fully reusable, recyclable, or compostable. So basically, we are working to keep uh, waste in the economy and out of the environment. Uh, it may it may also be good and worth to mention that that we have launched uh, the Unilever Climate Transition Action Plan. So we also believe that climate change is one of the biggest environmental issues that we have at the moment. And we are working to reduce emissions from the life cycle of our products, from the upstream in the raw materials and the packaging we use to the downstream in the distribution and use of the disposal of our products. Uh, as this action plan includes uh, the whole life cycle, we can do it without impacting the scope fee. So we are partnering closely with our suppliers and encourage them uh, and other partners to reduce their, their emission as well and set their own size bench target. Fantastic. And um, if I could just stick with you for a moment, um, what changes to the design process does the circular economy imply? What, what, what might your designers be, be thinking differently or doing differently uh, to, to support this shift? Cool. Um, thanks, Derek. So look, in the past, we think of design and uh, we think of the end result, but we've changed the Unilever's thinking here. And now we think about design holistically. And we design holistic product experiences using tools and methods that put our consumers at the heart of all of our brand interactions so that we're baking in their desire for sustainable behavior in our product creation from the outset. And we've also introduced visual design elements to educate and communicate to the consumer the brand's change in materials and suggest recycling methods for the new materials to keep them in the loop. So design is essential to meet the commitments that we have in regarding reducing our environmental impact. And so as such, we've adopted an internal framework which shapes our thinking and future innovation. We call it less plastic, better plastic or no plastic. Now with less plastic, it's about using lighter, stronger, better materials and smart design, importantly, to ultimately help us cut down how much plastic we use in the first place. And with better plastic, it's about eliminating problematic and unnecessary plastics using recyclable materials and more recycled content. For example, we're eliminating the use of polystyrene and moving the recyclable polymers like polypropylene and some of our products are using 100% consumer recycled plastic like the bottle used per 
Van Gogh's soy sauce or Hellman's jars and bottles in our US markets. Another good example of the work that we've done is launching Magnum's recycled plastic ice cream tubs, which is the world's first ice cream tub to use PPPCR that withstands our rigorous cold chains. And then the final uh, is no plastic. So it's exactly that. It's uh, using alternative materials, new packaging formats and alternative models of consumption, offering consumers the choice of packaging beyond plastic. And some examples in this area, the move from our uh, carted door ice cream tubs in some European countries from 100% plastic to a recyclable and compostable paper tub alternative. Um, also, all the trial that we've done in ice cream where we eliminated the wrappers of our in-home multi-packs for Solero brand. And then finally, refill and reuse is arguably the best option that the industry has in order to reduce or eliminate the environmental impact. So therefore, we're testing refill solutions around the world to eliminate that need for plastic. So for example, in Bintera in Indonesia, we've launched a refillery in the Saruga packaging free store where shoppers can buy as much or as little as they want using their own containers. Because we believe that rethinking systems, that they've got plenty of challenges, but the main is that uh, the current shopper mindset and behaviours, we need to overcome those by communicating environmental and economic advantages that come with refilling. Because one size will not fill, uh, not fit or fill all regions, but global change needs to be a whole system behind it. And with this, we're sharing all of our learnings with our peers, our customers and the governments. So for initiatives like this to, to succeed, we need to believe um, and we need to make our consumers believe that widespread public communications campaigns uh, are, you know, kind of in, in place that help clarify the benefits of our refill strategy alongside with smaller scale campaigns for specific refills or reuse solutions. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, yeah, interesting to hear about some of the, the drivers for that as well. What's driving some of those, those changes, um, the different sort of pressures and motivations. Um, Linda, Jan, um, can you can you expand on this a bit with the Philips context? What might enable you to design more circular products? Well, yeah, let, let me first start with your own responsibility um, and uh, having the commitment from top down management to to improve. Um, that's where it all starts. They have to believe in it. Uh, so I like the examples also from Unilever on how they are stepping up uh, and you see similar activities within Philips. So a commitment to apply recycled plastics. Uh, we've made that commitment a long time ago, and you can see tangible examples in, in vacuum cleaners and irons and these kind of devices. Um, maybe also good, we see this external pool coming from um, uh, hospitals, for example. We've talked earlier today about the impact of textiles, but also the, the healthcare industry is a massive impact in the global uh, uh, global uh, uh, impact of G, uh, 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 emissions. Uh, but you also see retailers stepping up, for example, Amazon with the carbon pledge is an example. We see more retailers. So the demand from the market is changing. Uh, so next to the intrinsic responsibility and move that we want to make, also we see this, this landscape around us to change quickly. Uh, consumers are asking for that. So both professional and uh, the consumer's part. Um, and that makes it very interesting for us to, to, to you know, to, to, to cooperate jointly with universities, recyclers, uh, professionals uh, in the hospital environment, and that is creating a drive. Maybe a good example is also the changing business models. So if we have a refurbishing business in the medical sectors, that requires us to rethink of like, what if we get these devices back? We've made the pledge a couple of years ago that we will repurpose all the medical appliances that have come back to us. What does it mean for the whole return flow? What does it mean for your design? And you see also new business models in the consumer domain. Try and buy business models. Um, you know, if you're having more expensive products, why want to buy it if you can first try it? And if you don't like it, send it back. We refurbish it and bring it back to a second user. But you can also have, um, earlier today, we talked about newborns. If you have devices, especially in that kind of portfolio, what we call the mother and child care portfolio, not all the products you need to have for a long time, you just need it for a couple of months. So can we go into an access-based model over a uh, linear business model where you buy the device? And that also automatically drives you to think about what if I get the product back, how can I make it more circular and how can I make it applicable for a second user? And those are drivers that define the circular strategy uh, in your device, but also in the systems and the servicing that you're operating in. Okay, uh, we're getting a sense of what some of the the opportunities are of, of things like moving from access from ownership to access. 
um, for, uh, or trying products and then uh, sending them back to be refurbished. And clearly some of that is happening now and some of it's yet to be unlocked. Um, sticking with you, how might, and, and, and really we come on to the, the, um, the crux of this broader conversation today, how can legislation and policy influence the right design choices and outcomes in your organization? How can, how can legislation unlock some of that greater opportunity? Uh, I, if I if I can take the floor, so if I if I look at that, um, we are not out there alone. Um, uh, Philips has a good intrinsic ambition. That's at least what I believe. Uh, but regulation is required to raise the bar to ensure that the market as a whole is moving in the right direction. We need those to ensure that also the focus for the improvement is correct. So focus on those elements that really can drive for a tangible change in the right direction. Um, and I'll be honest, if, if I look at, we are a global player, uh, in order to be successful regulation, don't put a regulation at country level, but aim for regional or maybe even global alignment. Um, we are unfortunately confronted with a plethora of look alike or slightly different requirements at country level that actually can have a negative environmental impact where you're not allowed, for example, to market a product that is allowed in market A, but you can't ship it to market B because it's slightly different requirements. So requirements are essential. You need regulation to move to ensure that the weakest performing um, producer or product in the market is, you know, it's also moving in the right direction and you are not all around there um, uh, hampering actually you to continue because you put some effort and, and uh, money into it, into this. Maybe a good example is gross regulations uh, on the chemical substances we talked about earlier today, which is applied in multiple countries uh, in a similar setup across the globe. However, some countries are starting to deviate. Um, but also maybe a good example is that, that regulations can hamper. There is uh, a few examples that I have where we want to apply recycled plastics, but we can't. We can't actually import recycled materials in that country. We can't do it because the regulation doesn't allow us. And that's also referred to we have a refurbishment business, and sometimes we simply can't sell refurbished devices or we can't import or export products that are suitable for uh, refurbishing. So regulation is that it's crucial, uh, but alignment uh, and thinking, uh, in making regulation circular in design itself is also crucial. And uh, Jamie and Jesus, uh, same question to you. Uh, what might be similar or different in the Unilever, the food and, and packaging context about the legislation that might make circular design choices possible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, thanks. So, 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 some similarities, some, some difference there. But, but yeah, we, we believe this is essential. Uh, and maybe if, if, if I can give you three examples that I think well, how legislation and policy is going to influence, or three ways. Uh, so the first one will be uh, implementing EPR. So we've been talking about that in the, in the past. So effectively extend the producer responsibility. The second one will be incorporating a cross industry rules for sustainable packaging design. And maybe the last, uh, the last one, uh, maybe not in order of importance, uh, it would be having a coordinated international response. So going in, in a bit detail into, into some of those, um, so extended producer responsibility, we need policies to help uh, with creating the right environment for circular economy. Uh, EPR has a significant role in influencing design decisions. That, that, is, that is quite obvious for us, so th because uh, EPR fees are, are linked to how easy a piece of packaging is to, to recycle, so easier to recycle, lower recycling cost, lower EPR fees. Uh, and uh, regarding EPR is something that is very important as well is that we believe in what is called e-commodulation, whereby producers are incentivized to move to better materials and where uh, use uh, hard to or non-recyclable materials that is incentivized to higher fees. And so for us, that, that, is, that is very important because when well designed uh, is an important mechanism for incentivizing the design of, of sustainable packaging. If I can go to the second one, that is the, the golden or the design rules. Uh, a good example of these design rules is the golden the golden rules initiative from the Consumer Goods Forum uh, Plastic Waste Coalition. Uh, these are a set of standards uh, and a good selection that will help uh, drive better packaging designs, increase collective action and also accelerate progress towards a circular economy. And also something that is very important is that these rules include the use of clear and accurate unpacked recycling instructions, uh, which will help consumers. So we need to, to bring consumers into, into, into this as well. And the last one, as I said, 
uh, we need uh, a UN treaty to, to tackle plastic pollution. So uh, systemic changes uh, requires a coordinated international response. Just as climate change has the Paris Agreement, plastic should have its own uh, binding treaty, which, which will set the world of course for, for reducing plastic waste. Um, a treaty, how we, how, we, uh, how we see it, is that a good one will be the one that put uh, reduction at the heart of the global policy. Seeking to reduce uh, pollution of in plastic and promote the use of recycled content and drive towards new business models. Um, it will it will set goals with with clear national targets and also plan similar. If we got, if I come back to, to that to that similar to the 1.5 degrees for for climate, um, and and a city will will also uh, help uh, level the playing fields across geographies and harmonize the standards and definitions across markets. Uh, so yes, again, uh, very important, uh, and we believe if uh, these three, three, three areas of the of the actions that I that I mentioned can be implemented, it will have a huge impact on accelerating circular economy. Brilliant. So I'm hearing um, a lot of the the opportunity is around harmonising uh, standards and, and language, uh, as well as uh, the focus on on things like EPR as well. Um, just to really, uh, as we sort of reach the end of our conversation. Just to really uh, make this real for 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 me and for for folks uh, listening online, um, do you have an example of how a policy change made a circular design decision easier or harder? Uh, Linda, Jan, you mentioned a couple uh, already around the movement of 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 waste or or materials considered waste, but is there anything else you you could share there? Yeah, well, maybe indeed uh, building further on what I just said about uh, application of recycled materials. So, uh, first of all, what makes it easier? You know, if there is a, a, like this is a pledge uh, requested by the European Commission, so we're requesting like those companies, do you want to do something? So, yes, we were eager to do something and make a pledge about the application of recycled plastics. So, that was very good. And I, I'm talking about the products, not the packaging, but really about the products. Uh, maybe building on that, we've seen a uh, um, uh, vacuum cleaners, for example, you have seen eco design requirements uh, around vacuum cleaners in Europe, uh, including unfortunately uh, banned, but soon hopefully back uh, energy efficiency label. You can see in there requirements around the durability of the motor and the durability of the hose. Um, I think that has been uh, crucial to to move on uh, with uh, with eco design or vacuum cleaners. Uh, you can see similar activities under the television, uh, but maybe what it makes harder is also um, let's refer to something recently is the right to repair or maybe I, I prefer personally the, the right to access to professional repair. Um, there is a discussion ongoing. I think it's good to to have this outlook like how can I make products more durable? But you have this design constraints. If I have a product which has hygienic or medical or whatever constraints in it, uh, how do I ensure that a device is, is a um, still suitable for its purpose after it has been um, repaired, for example. So these kind of discussions can also make it harder actually to come with a horizontal applicable standard. You have to think of like, how can I make reg regulations in such a way that it does ensure that a proper use after you know, repair, for example, is possible. Um, so I think these kind of discussions are good, but it requires a careful considerations of all the constraints that you normally have have to deal with under under design. Okay, and uh, and then the same question to to Jesus and, and Jamie. Um, perhaps an example of a of a policy measure that's made circular design easier or harder. Yeah. So so maybe I can I can give two two quick ones. Uh, and and uh, it, it's going to be just just going back to to my last comment. Uh, I guess that the first one will be uh, the eco modulation of the EPR. Um, so it, it, it makes the business case for expensive material more compelling. So it makes it easier for us to, to, to create that business case when we have that eco modulation in place. And, uh, and maybe the second one will be uh, when we're talking about um, rethink system or, or creating systemic change, and more specifically on the refill and reuse example. So these uh, are, are kind of new. So this is emerging, emerging systems. Uh, that means that regularity guidelines and public policies can be based in some cases. Uh, and we have done some of the some of the projects, some of the pilots would have come across uh, challenges uh, in, in, in this in this pilot. And we, we expect that to, to change. Um, so, um, so, for example, having government policy, including setting standards and providing incentivized for refilling and reducing packaging, 
that can create the right enabling environment for us uh, and for the industry for for these models to uh, to become to become bigger. Brilliant. Uh, Jamie and Jesus and Linda Jan, thank you so much for for joining me for this conversation. We're really delighted to be able to work with with Philips and Unilever to understand the opportunities and barriers to implementing circular design in practice and being able to to learn more about that is always a, a pleasure. Uh, so thanks for thanks for the conversation and I'll hand back to you thank now, you. Karen. That's great. Joe, actually stay on because we've been interesting. Um, somebody wants to know, could you explain what echo modulation in EPR is? Is anybody? Well, I, I don't think I could, but um, I believe that was uh, Jesus who was sharing that. Oh, Jesus. OK, Jesus, if you can fire that into the chat box actually afterwards. Um, yeah, do that, you, yeah, do just put it into the chat box because I think people wanted to know what it meant. Um, but uh, Linda Artian, Jesus, Jamie and Joe, thank you so much. Joe, you did a brilliant job on the facilitation. Thanks a million for that. You can turn off your camera now and mute your microphone because um, it's time now. We're, we're running behind a schedule, but we're still OK. We still have plenty of time, I think, for this segment. It's the time for our first interactive workshop where we hope to get as much engagement as possible from those of you watching us online. And I will also get to some of the comments that have already been put in the chat box. Now, the theme of this workshop is which policy instruments can shape circular design? We're going to have an exchange of experiences about the kind of policies that are already in place or are being proposed and those policies and how they will influence the design of products and again, during this segment, this is where we'd really like to get your engagement when we open up the floor, the virtual floor, after our couple of speakers have given their initial presentations. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how to do that. First of all, there's the chat box. You can submit your points through the chat box. But if you also would like to speak to us virtually, so if you want to turn on your video and camera, just please press the raised hand icon on your platform and then I'll keep scrolling through the participant box and when I spot there's a hand up, when we come to the um, interactive part of it, I'll go to you. Just make sure, please, your connection um, is working. But first, we're going to hear from the European Commission and then afterwards, we're going to hear from the French Ministry of the Environment. And then we'll also have input from a G20 member and also from the OECD. And then we'll be getting your inter uh, input after that. Um, so let's start. And I'd like to invite our first speaker to take the floor. Matthias Malgai is the head of unit of sustainable products with the European Commission's DG Environment. And Matthias is going to talk about something we heard earlier in the opening about the very far reaching set of policy proposals that were put forward by the European Commission this March. And the goal is to make products that are placed on the market for the EU's 450 million consumers align with climate global climate, environment and pollution goals. So, Matthias, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Yes. Hi. Hello to everybody. I, I understand it's different time zones, so I'm not going to do the, the the greeting of the of the time, but it's very good to be here. Thanks a lot for having me and I'm looking forward to discussion with, uh, with the other panelists. I would just first like to run you through quickly um, the most recent proposal um, that we've done on um, uh, promoting circular economy and sustainable products. Uh, it's not murder by PPT, I promise. Uh, it's going to be first just short explanation why we actually did what we did, but having listened to the session just now, I think it's rather obvious. So it's it's the big picture, the, the main things we want to achieve, then a quick overview of how this fits in the, the overall um, framework we've got, and then at the end, um, a bit on international cooperation, which again, I think was mentioned quite a few times as, as one of the key things and uh, European Commission and European Union certainly thinks so. So if we can move on to my first slide, please. Um, now, I'm sure this has been discussed, but it's very good to, to keep in mind really the mega trends. So um, one thing that's uh, contained in our analysis was looking at, for example, the, the work of the International Resource Panel, which is in the figures on your left. Um, 
basically, despite growing international legal framework, despite growing national or regional uh, legal frameworks and policy frameworks, um, the trends, especially on, on resource use and climate, are going in the wrong direction. So that's, uh, that's the first bit. Um, second part um, is also publicly available research on um, European consumption, which I'm sure applies also in similar fashion to, to some other regions in the world, uh, that shows that our consumption, um, despite relatively limited share of world population, is exceeding planetary boundaries in a number of areas. So I think this, this is really in a nutshell. Um, why we felt that we need to move on um, to a next new innovative generation of regulation to help us push forward our policy objectives and our societal um, goals. If we move on to the next slide, please. Again, something that um, has been discussed already today. Um, so the mega trends I mentioned are pretty closely linked um, or almost intrinsically linked to the consumption and through that um, in big part to uh, products. Um, this uh, initiative we're dealing with is not dealing with food, maybe just to mention that up front. Um, and up to 80%, this is the figure that, that we like to quote, um, but up to 80% of the impact of the product throughout its time of use and disposal, so life cycle, um, uh, is, is uh, basically affected at the design stage. Um, but at the same time, as Joe was explaining in his presentation, um, products are generally not designed for sustainability. There is progress. Um, again, uh, two examples were given from two companies, uh, which we like and appreciate, but the, 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 the rate of acceleration is, is not even close to what we need to address the, the challenges I mentioned before. Uh, another thing, again, something that was mentioned before, um, information on products, uh, both the information that consumers want and often the information that businesses would like to have or need to have um, is lacking or is not available in a format or form that, uh, that would actually serve the objectives they have. Um, what I'm mentioning now is all subject to extensive analysis what we call an impact assessment analysis that's actually publicly available for those who would want to dig in a bit deeper on that. Now, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, now, I'm zooming in on what were the things, and again, I'm, I'm benefiting from many of those being mentioned just before. What are the aspects of design that we would like to influence um, and I'm going to explain a little bit more how we influence them later on, not to, to worry those of you who are less familiar with our regulation that really think we can prescribe everything in little detail. So what's in front of you, again, is the aspects of products that largely affect how long we can use these products, um, whether we can repair them in an easy fashion as well, which is also um, uh, extremely linked to whether we use them for longer or not. Can we recycle them? Can we use them again? Um, can we take materials out of them in a fashion that really promotes circularity? Are they produced in a way that uh, doesn't have undue um, or excessive environmental impacts, uh, including the carbon footprint? Uh, and how does the design of the product contribute to the, to the generation of waste? Um, uh, I didn't mention the almost the uh, most obvious one, at least to the to the European audience, which is um, uh, um, energy efficiency, uh, which is at the heart actually of the existing um, uh, law that we have on eco design uh, that uh, basically generated um, it generates savings. So. The laws we have in place to put requirements on energy related products, improving their performance, are estimated to, to, to run up to energy savings on annual basis in European Union that are roughly equivalent to all the, the wind generation that we managed to, to put in place. So it's um, uh, regulating relatively seemingly smaller things um, with a very huge cumulative impact. And if we move on to the next slide, 
um, this is about the, the the main reason we 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 looked at the functioning um, framework of rules and and we are trying to build on them. And with this, we're trying to achieve. Um, on one hand, in the area of environment, um, European Union's and, and its member states' environmental goals, and make our own contribution to the SDG and, and Agenda 2030. Um, we also want to um, to reduce some other environmental impacts uh, that are not necessarily um, contained in that framework. Uh, we want to address what was a clearly expressed um, desire of consumers in Europe um, to to have rules in place that will help improve products performance and, and, and their lifetimes, again, depending a little bit on, on which categories of products. Um, and as I mentioned before, the energy savings, just as one really important example, um, it was estimated that um, European uh, consumers saved last year um, over, um, over 40 billion euros um cumulatively from from less uh, use of energy um, as a result of the rules we have in place and and this is um, projected to grow um, with current energy prices all the way to 200 billion euros so pretty massive um, savings for the citizens uh, based on a on a sort of regional regulation that uh, applies for a market of nearly 500 million people uh, and then finally, we also want to address what was identified in our consultation uh, by supply chain actors. Uh, on one hand, reduced material costs that should result from um, improved circularity. And then um, also things related to transparency of the supply chain, including very importantly, the reputational benefits. Because uh, we clearly identified there are uh, reputational benefits for those companies that produce uh, more sustainable products. We move on to the next uh, one, please. Um, sorry, we're now entering in the world of complex visual designs that um, people in my organization think help things understand. Um, uh, but uh, for those of you who are less visual, just to, to sort of mention um, what, what I already alluded to, um, we have this regulation that we're talking about in, in my presentation at the heart of uh, what the commission proposed. But of course, um, you cannot regulate everything and it's not a uh, one one shot uh, that solves it all. It's not a silver bullet solution. So it was presented in a package that also includes a uh, strategy on um, sustainable textiles that looks at the sector as a whole. Um, it includes important messages and actions on global action. So we see clearly this as something we want to spearhead, but we want to do it um, together with our international partners. Um, we improved our um, consumer protection rules, uh, and we intend to um, uh, even reinforce stronger the, the measures we have in place to help small and, and, and also big companies to um, adopt circular business models. And then uh, finally, we're doing um, something very similar to what we're doing here for construction products um, in, a, in a separate piece of legislation. If we move on to the next one. So this slide is hopefully showing to many of you something that's visually um, relatable. Um, it shows the European Union energy label. And um, basically what you see um, on, on the slide is the label that has different classes of performance um, visually expressed in a simple way that uh, has a huge uh, pull effect uh, on consumer decisions. And this is just uh, an example um, uh, reinforcing what I mentioned before that um, we're basically working on a um, Example of something that existed for some time that works, uh, but what it will do now is it's aiming at much bigger impacts, but also admittedly entering into a, a, a much higher complexity. Um, and that's why we treat it very respectfully, because one thing, and even that was not so simple at the beginning, is to set the right levels of, um, of um, uh, looking at one parameter, which in this case was energy use, 
that had been um, expanded a bit in uh, in recent times with uh, with things such as uh, repairability or water consumption, um, and to expand it much much beyond that. So we know there's going to be a lot of challenges. I'm going to speak a little bit about them later on, but the key message is it's something that works and something that we see being replicated in many jurisdictions around the world. Um, so. Um, uh, as again mentioned by one of the speakers uh, before, we understand that economic operators would want to have as much predictability as possible. Just a comment that I'm not able to read the comments in a comment section. I will be only answering those questions that the moderator will be passing on to me um, after I'm done. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please. So just a little bit of, a, of a, it's not really a nitty gritty, but something that I think is very important also for the international audience. The proposal that the commission proposed, the way these things work in European Union will now be discussed by our member states and European Parliament. Um, based on past examples, this is a process that usually would be expected to take no less than two years. So um, nothing is entering into force um, um, as of today. Uh, and then a second factor, which is very important for both players in European market uh, and elsewhere, is that um, this will only be a framework, sort of a toolbox that lists all um, uh, the reasons why you would do something uh, that allow your analysis to decide on which products to work and all the aspects that you basically can choose to, to regulate, but, uh, but you choose them based on a thorough impact assessment. So every measure we do will be really looking thoroughly at all issues, including how effective is the measure to achieve the environmental objective or circularity objective. Um, is it affordable? Um, does it affect uh, competitiveness, costs, administrative burden, and so on? Um, and then finally, um, also to be to have this as a co-creation process that is very inclusive. Um, the products that we would eventually regulate uh, are determined through a consultation and part of a multi-annual working plan. So what uh, we intend to do and what's being done now is to have a multi-annual predictability on what is coming online. And then there's a very inclusive, if you can move to the next slide, um, process that, that allows uh, all the stakeholders to, um, to engage in it. So what are those things that are new now? Um, and and a bit, I mentioned under the new requirements, so all the things you could see that make products last longer, more recyclable, uh, more reusable, um, reducing their environmental input, those would be subject of requirements. Uh, that we can introduce in new measures. Uh, the scope had extended beyond energy related products. So it now applies uh, hypothetically to most of the, of, the, of the goods that are sold on European market. However, I really want to emphasize this. This does not mean a regulatory um, uh, tsunami. Um, because we don't think it makes sense. Uh, we want to focus on really high priority areas. And what we can expect in, uh, I think the most ambitious scenario would be um, sort of doubling the current existing regulations on eco design, which is around 30 product groups um, to, to also regulate the, with the new requirements and, and with this broader scope. Um, examples that were given, uh, but these are sectors uh, more than products, are um, textiles, furniture, um, ICT products, which we already partially uh, do regulate, and so on. Second thing we, we may do um, is uh, we are foreseeing to, to do is also introduce horizontal measures that could save um, a lot of regulatory time and, and uh, allow different products that have characteristics that are common enough to be regulated with one um, piece. One example that already exists today in Europe is um, a standby regulation that uh, basically deals with energy efficiency during the standby stage of all the, all the appliances that use it. And uh, that had been very effective and, and, and drove down the energy use during standby stage considerably. And then finally, as I mentioned uh, 
lack or insufficient information is one of the big problems we identified, increased focus on product information. Uh, please move on. So just to recap for uh, those of you who will want to participate in this, especially economic operators, the process um, is we first identify the working plan. I'm going to say a few words about the first one uh, towards the end of this presentation. That's not far from now. Uh, then we do, um, let's uh, call it an exploratory um, stage where we do studies with the involvement of uh, stakeholders and experts. Um, we do impact assessment. Um, we have a, a forum that uh, brings together the, the relevant stakeholders from civil society, of course, to economic operators. And then at the end, um, there would be a measure uh, on a product. So what we're talking about is uh, the earliest few years from now uh, for first measures. We'd like to adopt them as fast as we can. We think this is a transformative uh, measure, um, but this is the nature of, of working on complex issues. So um, there will be, uh, I guess, my second message is time to engage with us if your sector um, is involved. Um, if we can move on, just one word. I really don't want to go in details here, but one of the novelties that we foresee is that our measures would also include provisions on digital product passport, um, which is something that's already uh, being developed in different sectors or supply chains. Um, basically, what we're looking for is to have a unique identifier and distributed um, uh, through a di distributed um, um, storage, uh, where basically the most relevant data to the product, which we would define and, and impact assess, would be available to different actors in the chain on a need-to-know basis. So, for example. If um, a consumer needs to know something that's affecting his choice decision, um, that would be available to them. But if it's more relevant for the for the uh, link in a supply chain, uh, that would be available to them. Uh, but also to recyclers, um, uh, refurbishers, and uh, so on. If we move on towards the last, um, yeah, last two slides, and again, I'm. Just here, I think the key thing I'd like to say is that we're really keen to, um, to work with all international partners, be it governments, governments or international organizations. Um, the process itself in Europe, the regulatory process is going to be very inclusive. The, the requirements are, um, are applicable to all products, no matter where they are produced. Um, we we had already first presentation um, on voluntary basis in the WTO, and we'll, um, each of the measures would also be um, under formal consultation. So it's really something that we see as an opportunity um, to everybody who wants to operate on a European market, um, and um, something that we hope, because uh, we clearly understand that uh, the appeal of what we do if, if we compare it to the problems I described at the very uh, beginning, um, which are global, uh, should help in, 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 a, in a take up of similar approaches. And we also willing to learn from the others uh, around the globe. And then if we move on to the very last slide. So to, to make this happen and to help, because we also know that um, there are different the levels of capacities uh, that exist, we are we are willing to work. Not willing to work. We're actually already preparing um, guidance. Uh, we will engage as we are today in, in different multilateral fora, and then also I think for um, once we know which products we're working on, we'll also our impact assessment. We look at the international consequences, so we will have a pretty clear understanding if there are significant producers of certain products, I'm pretty sure we'll engage and, and uh, with them and make sure that their operators have a, a full um, and transparent way of, of being engaged in preparation of the role. So I'll stop here. Uh, I know we've been already a bit late and I hope I didn't take too long, Karen. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stay back and wait to be called on um, if anything else is expected of me. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you very much, Matthias, for a very, very clear um, comprehensive presentation on those new proposals. I'm sure people will have questions for you, especially from an international perspective as well, as this is a, a G20 uh, workshop. Um, so stay with us. Just you can turn off your camera for the moment, Matthias, and your mic, and we'll come back to you when we come to the discussion part of it. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our second speaker here. Sylvain Chavassus is from the French Environment Ministry. And Sylvain will talk about France's world leading policy to promote more circular design through the use of a transparency index for consumers on the repairability of products. Sylvain, you're very, very welcome. We're looking forward to hearing about uh, the Transparency Index. I'll hand over to you and when you're finished, you can just call me back and I'll come back on screen. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to share uh, the French um, experience. Uh, talking about uh, product circular design, uh, we thought uh, it could be interesting to present um, our repairability index on electric and electronic products that we introduced uh, last year. So the next slide, please. So here is the uh, index. Uh, you can see it at the bottom uh, of uh, the slide. Uh, it consists uh, in a, a mark. Uh, about the reparability level of products uh, on uh, one score, one to ten, with also a, a color code according to the reparability uh, uh, level. Uh, the objectives obviously are to um, inform the consumers about the reparability uh, level of the of the products, uh, generally to boost uh, repair and uh, also to push uh, eco-design uh, so that uh, manufacturers uh, uh, are pushed uh, to uh, make uh, uh, more repairable, better repairable products. The next slide. So our repairability index uh, is uh, based on a shared and robust methodology. Obviously, it's very important to use uh, harmonized uh, methods and, uh, and, and tools. Uh, and uh, so this uh, uh, repairability index is uh, co-developed uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, there is a horizontal uh, steering committee with uh, all the stakeholders. And there are um, sector working groups uh, for, for the, 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 the repairability uh, index on the different uh, product categories. And these working groups are chaired by uh, the sector uh, uh, professional uh, association. And all this uh, is uh, taking place under the leadership of the public authorities. So the, the Environment uh, Ministry and the Environment um, Agency. The next slide, please. So uh, at the moment, uh, nine uh, product categories are concerned uh, with the repairability um, index. Um, since uh, January uh, last year, uh, we started with uh, laptops, uh, front load uh, washing machines, TVs, uh, electric uh, lawn mowers and smartphones. Uh, and starting on the 4th of November, we'll have uh, also uh, vacuum cleaners, uh, top load washing machines, dishwashers and pressure washers. The next slide. So how is this uh, repairability index uh, calculated? Uh, there are five main uh, criteria uh, groups. Uh, availability of the technical uh, documentation, ease of disassembly, availability of spare parts, price of spare parts. So these, these first four uh, criteria categories are horizontal to all the product categories. And then there is a fifth uh, criteria uh, category, which, is, uh, which uh, are specific to the product category. And uh, all this is equally weighted and uh, to produce a synthetic uh, score on a scale of one to 10. So the repairability uh, index that are then 
put um, on the on the products themselves or at least uh, uh, on the um, in the in the stores uh, on the on the shelves just next to the product um we 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 took as as a reference for the the org for the information uh the organization of the european uh, energy label so the next slide please so what kind of feedback do we have after one year of implementation uh, the repairability index is popular with consumer and there is already a good level of uh, notoriety among consumers and uh, also uh, consumers um, think that the repairability index uh, is is a good incentive uh, for the repair of uh, of, of products uh, we we see also uh, some first positive effect effects on um, on eco design for example some firms uh, have um, uh, made uh, 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 spare parts more more available they have increased also uh, the the provision of uh, repair manuals and 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 so on and uh, we also see uh, some uh, first uh, uh, effects on, uh, on 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 the design of the products to make uh, products uh, more repairable and so that uh, the brands can get uh, better uh, scores under the repairability um, uh, index. Uh, generally, the repairability index is also uh, contributing uh, in a positive way to the the general uh, dynamic on. Uh, on boosting um, uh, repair together with uh, other uh, instruments and, uh, and and policies, and also we got um, interest from uh, other other countries, um, and uh, we and also uh, the, the European Commission has uh, started some um, some work, and we really hope that uh, we will see um, the, the the establishment of a, of a European level uh, repairability uh, index and I would like to take this opportunity to to say that we support very much the uh, Commission's uh, proposal on the co-design of sustainable uh, products that has just been uh, presented. So the next slide uh, please and I think it's the last one uh, yes, you can find uh, more information on the repairability index in French and English at this uh, web page, uh, and uh, you can find also some uh, some of the, the the necessary tools. For example, if you are if you are a business involved um, in such uh, uh, products. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvain. Very comprehensive. I think a lot of people, again, will have questions for um, you about the repairability index and even where you find professional people to repair these products. Um, just before we open up the floor, though, um, I want to go to a um, G20 member country entrepreneur, Kyle Wines. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Kyle, but you can you can correct me if I'm not. Kyle is the founder of iFixit, and this was mentioned earlier. It's an online repair community and parts retailer. It's internationally renowned for its open source uh, repair manuals and product uh, teardowns. And Carl is a world expert on right to repair legislation, much of which he and his community is um, they've helped to push forward. Kyle, you're very welcome. You can tell me how you pronounce your second name as well. And you're going to tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and the right to repair policy. Absolutely. It's Weens Rhymes with Beans. Very excited to be here. It's uh, I'm on the west coast of the US, so it's a little bit early here. Um, but super uh, excited to be having this conversation. And I have to say the effect of European policy and uh, the the French repairability index in particular really can't be understated. It's had a massive shift in uh, consumer perception in Europe, but it's really had a, a, a shift in how manufacturers are approaching this and thinking about product design. Um, I thought I would share with you briefly um, a little bit of what is uh, what we're seeing uh, with right to repair. Just so you, uh, I'll spend 60 seconds talking about the US kind of policy landscape. 
and then I want to show some product designs that we've run into. Uh, the right to repair movement is this idea that we should be able to fix things ourselves, that we should have access to repair parts and information. We used to have that. Uh, and I think in many respects, as we talk about building a circular economy, like we used to have a circular economy. <laughs> we've, we've really regressed. We've gone backwards over the last 50 years. Um, uh, and uh, so there is increasing push to, uh, to make it easier for people to get access to repair information. Uh, fortunately, we're making great progress. Um, right to repair legislation uh, is the idea that we should have access to parts, tools, and know how this is a policy framework. Uh, that has been developed in the U.S. There's been more uh, emphasis on improving product designs in Europe and more emphasis on providing access to a repair ecosystem in the United States. Uh, this has culminated uh, in just a couple weeks ago, the state of New York passed the first broad sweeping uh, electronics right to repair law that says basically for every product that costs more than $10 that's put on the market, manufacturers have to make service parts uh, manuals and tooling, including uh, including software repair tooling available. So we expect this will have a big impact. Uh, and of course, the European U uh, Union, the European Parliament has consistently uh, been pushing for e you know, eco design that includes repairability. Um, this is important because we have product designs like this is a this is an espresso machine with a, a oval screw. There's no reason for a screw like this to be on the product except to stop people from getting into it. And that leads to this kind of pattern of disposability that we have. Um, I know we, we've been talking about repair labeling. I want to I want to show you a practical hands-on example of a product that is why repair labeling is so important. Um, the AirPods are one of the best-selling products, and I'm, I'm not I don't want to just single Apple out, but I'm going to for the sake of time. There are many many products where this is a case, um, but th this particular product has a design that is egregious that nobody knows about. Uh, this is a very popular product. Probably many of you on this call are using this uh, product uh, to, to watch right now. And this has batteries built in. The thing with batteries is they are consumable. They wear out. Uh, a consumable like this is really only going to last for 18 months to two and a half years, depending on how it, uh, aggressive your use of the product is. Um, and there's no way to access those batteries without totally cutting the product apart and destroying it. Uh, if you think about the repair scoring, how a product would score from, from you know, 0 to 10 on, on the French index, iFixit has our own repair scoring, and we scored this product a 0 out of 10. And the reason that it gets a 0 is the batteries are just totally integrated. You have a consumable. It's kind of like having a car with the tires welded to the frame. And when the tires wear out, you just throw away the car. That's how this product is designed. Um, and it's not necessary. So here's Samsung's equivalent product. Uh, this is their, their Galaxy Beans. Um, and uh, the, it just pops right open. The batteries come right out. They're not soldered in. There's no cutting involved. And this got an 8 out of 10 on our scorecard. But think about it from a consumer's perspective. You're at the electronics store and you have a choice between the Apple product and the Samsung product. You would have no way of knowing. You have no way of telling that one product is going to be disposable and one product is not. Uh, and uh, I think this is really important when you think about digital equity and inclusion. We, we're, we're talking about envir the environment, but I think we also have to think about global access to technology. And if a product is designed to fail after 18 months, it's not going to have a secondhand life. It's not going to be available for resale. It's not going to be available for, for use around the world. Many of uh, people around the world depend on secondhand electronics from the United States, the European Union, that are exported, repaired over and over again. And if you build in a, a death clock into a product where it, it has a short product life, it's only going to last for 18 months, no matter what you do, then I think we're increasing uh, in inequality around the world. Uh, and so this, this is where we have this kind of rare opportunity to accomplish uh, both increasing access to technology, bridging the digital divide, and also uh, in, in improving the environmental situation, building a circular economy at the same time. So right, uh, right to repair and these repairability labels are really an opportunity for a win-win across the policy landscape. And, and with that, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, Carl, great stuff. Thanks very much for that. Now let's open it out to our panelists um, and participants. 
we already have a couple of comments and questions coming in. I want to invite back Matias and Sylvain, if you both can join me. And also, I want to bring in to Peter Borka, team lead of Circular Economy in the Environment and Economy Integration Division, Environment Directorate at the um, OECD. Peter, you're very welcome uh, too. I'm going to go to you in just a moment for um, maybe some more of your comments, but just let's deal with some of the questions that have already been coming in. And it's one for you, uh, Matthias. What mm -hmm. weight will the European Commission give to sustainability compared to functionality, affordability, and competitiveness of products? And how can we ensure those considerations do not become obstacles to ambitious eco-design criteria? There's other stuff in the question, but maybe if you can deal with those two elements first, please. Yeah, it's a, it's a question almost answering itself, I'd say. Um, uh, first thing is, um, we will look, we've been doing it already. I think this is the first part of the answer. So it's basically a process of how do you look at the trade-offs um, and the way we're looking at them is we're looking at what already exists on a market. So you are normally not setting a requirement that is impossible to meet um, um, technologically or that has not already been proven to be met. So um, I think it's almost impossible to answer it as a generic um, question. Uh, but what we'll be looking at is in terms of affordability, we clearly know that, that it will be politically a no flyer if we have solutions that make things two, three, four times more expensive. So um, you do your studies, you do your market segment analysis, and then you try to figure out where the, where the level is. Um, the trickiest thing is, of course, with the competitiveness um, argument. But here, I think what we'll be looking at is, is we have to keep ambition high enough, environmental ambition and circularity and repairability ambition for these rules to make sense. There's no point in spending so much regulatory time and companies time in, in basically complying with something that doesn't achieve results. But the real answer will really come in the measures as we adopt them. There's a lot of um, learning time ahead of us when we'll be um, rolling things out, but, uh, but I'm sure also um, uh, Sylvain has good examples. For example, France has been has been spearheading trailblazing on some issues now, and they often found that things that looked a little bit less affordable at the beginning were actually taken up by the consumers. Um, so, so I'm optimistic, but I don't underestimate the complexity of this. Okay, there is another question in from you as well, Matches, but I will go to Sylvain for your comments, maybe on that question, um, and one specifically for you too. Has the French Repairability Index also created additional jobs in repair service shops? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this uh, question. I'm, I'm not sure I can give a, a really precise uh, answer, but certainly our circular economy policies uh, also aim uh, to uh, uh, promote the creation of jobs, uh, notably at uh, national and uh, local uh, level, because we know that uh, uh, many jobs uh, related to uh, uh, the environment, environmental protection in general, but uh, uh, also uh, obviously circular economy um, are local uh, jobs. Um, but concerning the repair sector, it's, um, it's a bit um, early to say or to really distinguish uh, precise uh, effects of the repairability index uh, uh, on the jobs. But uh, uh, really, one of the objectives uh, is to uh, boost uh, the, the repair sector. Uh, obviously, um, these uh, circular economy uh, policies um, are trying to uh, reverse the trend um, as um, as Kyle was saying, our economies used to be more, more circular, so they, they are used to be many more repairers than, than, than now. So we, we, an objective is to, to reverse this uh, trend. It's uh, estimated um, in France now that uh, we have uh, only uh, 5,000 uh, repairers. Um, on, in 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 the, the whole of uh, France, uh, whereas we would uh, need uh, uh, more than twenty thousand, uh, in fact, um, 
Well, another thing that uh, we, we see is that uh, the repairability index, but together with other um, policies and, and tools, um, contributes uh, positively to the demand uh, in, uh, in spare parts, to the demand uh, in, uh, in repair uh, services. So, so the positive um, effects uh, are uh, noticeable already. Uh, and so all this uh, should uh, lead uh, to uh, uh, hopefully um, positive uh, effects uh, uh, for um, uh, repair uh, uh, professions. Uh, and uh, we, we, we see really um, an increase uh, in uh, some, uh, but like in other countries, uh, repair cafes, for example, uh, and in the in the social economy uh, sector, and what we are seeing as well, and uh, this is really a positive effect of the repairability index and other circular economy policies, is that uh, many brands and um, retailers are investing again uh, in uh, after sales um, services uh, uh, and uh, and repair. Okay. So that's okay. that's really Just good. Just very quickly, Sylvain, how clearly are those labels on the products? You know, you, you gave very nicely those pictures of what they meant, but how, how clear is it to the consumer what those labels mean? Yes, they must be um, put um, close to uh, the product, um, or at least the, the model, uh, and um, at the moment of the purchase. Uh, so in uh, in many cases, uh, the label and the repairability index logo is is put uh, on on the shelf in in the stores uh, near uh, ne just next uh, or, or on the, the the model of the of the product. Uh, for the, the, there was a, a consumer study that has been uh, done by um, ADEM, which is the French Environment Agency, together with uh, Samsung, uh, which is uh, really uh, involved in the uh, implementation uh, of the repairability index uh, on, on its products. Well, I mean, they don't have the choice because it's a regulation, but they, they, they were among really the, 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 the first companies to implement it uh, in the transition period of the first year. Uh, and uh, so this uh, study showed uh, really good uh, results in terms of uh, consumer reception um, of uh, of the um, of the logo of the of the information in terms of uh, interest. As I said in my presentation, consumers also uh, believe uh, strongly that uh, this repairability index is useful and uh, can, can provide a good uh, incentive for for reparation now we need uh, we need to do uh, more specific uh, evaluation on on the on the effects of uh, of the act of repair uh, itself as i said okay. there is a positive trend generally in france in terms of the repair of products but uh, like in many many other countries we 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 starting from quite uh, quite low but uh, we will need a more, more specific evaluation. OK, very good. And clearly more repair people, professional repair people as well. Um, stay with us. Uh, I want to go to Peter Borke. Peter, you're very welcome. You're the team lead of Circular Economy in the um, Environment Directorates of the OECD's Environment and Economy Integration Division. Maybe just your views, uh, Peter, um, on what has been said so far by our three speakers. What do you think about the ideas, about the European Commission proposals, and indeed about the French efforts as well on the repairability index, and what Carl, Kyle was saying, sorry, about you know what's happening and, and that, and those issues about the Apple versus the Samsung AirPods, also very interesting. Thank you, Karen, and uh, hello to, to everyone, and particularly to, to good friends out there. Um, uh, so, at the OECD, not all of you may, may know the OECD, so the OECD is, a, is an intergovernmental think tank focused on, 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 on policy analysis. Um, we have a pretty broad portfolio uh, focused around the circular economy, and we're also looking into um, you know, policies uh, that uh, incentivize the design 
um, of uh, you know more repairable and recyclable and ultimately circular uh, products. Um, much of that is really focused on on plastics right now. Um, but uh, but I, I I have listened very carefully to uh, to to all the speakers and, and and thank you very much. I mean the presentations were were enlightening. Uh, um, I think you know I'd like to make a couple of points. Um, maybe to situate what we've been hearing uh, first of all, um, because I think it's important for everyone to understand that uh, the EU's and, and, and the French uh, uh, policies that are being put forward in the case of France actually already implemented, uh, these are really groundbreaking and innovative policies that we have not seen before. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, that, it, yeah, it's new. And I, I guess the, the, you know, the other side of that coin is that it, these policies are highly experimental and uh, uh, there will be a need uh, for regular assessment of their effects. And you, you've heard a little bit from Sylvain, you know, the, the expectations in terms of job uh, creation and stimulating the repair market, et cetera. Of course, that's all ex ante kind of um, uh, uh, analysis for the moment, or at least that's what I understand. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to have a pretty close follow-up uh, in terms of monitoring the, the impacts of the policies. I think the other point I want to make is that these approaches uh, that are being put forward um, by the EU and, and France, um, they are information-based. Uh, and that's great because uh, the idea here is really to provide information to consumers, but also to provide tools and incentives to producers to use that information for marketing purposes and, and competition in the market. Uh, so they, they are very much market-based in a way, but they, they involve, um, you know, that producers and consumers need to buy into them and they need to take interest and, um, uh, you know, the aim is, of course, to change behavior. Um, and so Silva was saying we're starting from a very low base in terms of repair activities. Uh, the question that I would also have, you know, what's going to be the ceiling? Because typically um, labels, um, environmental labels, uh, they are being taken up by a relatively small share of the population. Ultimately, they change the behavior only of around 10, maybe sometimes 15 percent um, of, of, of consumers. Um, so uh, uh, even though the energy efficiency label um, that um, Matthias was also uh, uh, talking about, uh, and that's been there for a very long time, has actually had a much more profound effect because it's really shifted the market, I understand. But, uh, but it's not a given that, you know, new information that will be put out around repairability, about, you know, uh, circular properties that products may have. Uh, will have those those same effects. So uh, maybe one one or actually two questions um, to uh, the, the speakers. Um, you know, how do they view those potential limitations and the diffusion um, of of those uh, information? You know, that information and its its uh, propensity to, to actually meaningfully impact the market and, and consumers uh, more more specifically and and the other question um uh, you know what's what's the amount you know how do you deal with this uh, element of experimentation that is necessarily there in the policies um and and you know what what are you planning in in, in terms of yeah maybe irregular updates and, and and modifications that may be needed and finally you know just to continue the, the context setting, and we've already heard uh, from a number of speakers also in the earlier uh, sessions. So here we're, of course, focusing on information-based policies to essentially support uh, repair, uh, which, which is which is ver sits very high up uh, in the hierarchy of what we're trying to achieve. Reuse is certainly you know, very, uh, a very noble uh, cause, better than recycling. Um, but of course, uh, there are many other policy tools as well uh, that we have in the toolbox to influence um, uh, 
product design for uh, the circular economy uh, that includes regulatory interventions such as uh, someone mentioned the ROHS uh, Rose uh, policy uh, that's been there for more than 20 years, I think uh, now, and which which essentially uh, restricts uh, you know hazardous substances that can be used uh, in uh, electric and electronic products. Um, but we also have market-based uh, instruments such as taxes uh, that, that are sometimes used uh, to influence material and, and substance choices. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, I just wanted to, yeah, put a little bit more context and put those two questions. And of course, if you're free to pick them up, uh, Karen or not. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Peter. We will put them now. I'll get our three panelists to comment on the points you've made. And by the way, if any of you who are participating online, we are getting some questions in through the chat box. Fire them in through the chat box. If you've more questions, then now is your opportunity to voice your opinions to us while our speakers are with us. If you want to actually speak physically, please press the raise your hand icon. And I'm flicking through the participants um, box all the time to see if we have raised hands and we'll try and go to you. Matthias, maybe go back to you for comments on the questions raised there by Peter. Yeah, I'll, I'll link that to a question that was in a, in a chat on a label. Um, so first on um, the, it's experimental, it's innovative and so on. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, the reason uh, first, the reason we're doing this is we've been talking about sustainable and consumption and production for well over a decade now, I think, also in a UN uh, framework. We've done quite a few things uh, and uh, we just simply see it wasn't enough. So that's the first point. The second point is um, that the things I put on, on on what we're trying to achieve, it's really been subject to very thorough analysis. What is already being done. So a lot of bullet points I've put out, for example, have standards already that we can use. Um, the work that Kyle and, and, and people in the in the repair movement have done has actually started the rolling that then, for example, French government picked up by, by being a pioneer. So what I'm trying to say is questions are super legitimate. We are really breaking the ground on the scale we're doing this. Uh, on a potential scale, but we're doing it because it's necessary and because we know it could be done. But the third element, of course, uh, which is super legitimate for Peter is as, as policymakers, we have to be very careful. I'm, I'm not a politician. I operate in the political world. But as a technocrat, we have to be careful that we do things that are workable. And this is where we use impact assessments. This is where we use extensive stakeholder consultations. So we really engage in talking to the people who are operating. And then finally, we review things. This is a bit nerdy, but uh, but we do review things regularly. Every of our rules will have um, a review um, stage of, let's say, between four, five, up to seven years. Um, and then very final point on this particular question is, yes, we probably will need to roll out a couple of measures first, see how they work before we go on with the more tricky ones where the trade-offs are much more complex. So that's a bit the question. That's the answer I give in, in almost my personal capacity, the last one. It's not an official policy. Um, second question was on, uh, there was almost an impression that this is information based only. Uh, and how do you avoid of not overcrowding um, the, the consumers with information? Um, first, it is not information based. And if I succeed, I will now share one of our existing energy labels. Um, is that on the screen, um, Karen? I'm not, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any slide okay. yet. So, uh, so here goes my plot to to be more. Um, is it coming more, from your computer, Matthias? Coming from my WebEx app, uh, and it's a okay. website. But I, I I drop it. We don't need it. If, if, if you get it later. Oh, hold on. There's something happening now. Or is there? Is now this, you've gone blank. <laughs> I've gone there blank. Okay, I very good. We, we got something here. Yes. Is this the is this the label? Can you see the label? Yes, washing machines and washing and what washer dryers. Yeah. So one one thing is you have to be we're super aware of. Um, I, I like the word I heard it in a recent study, infobicity. So if you cram too much information, the the consumer doesn't get it. And you have studies where they basically 
look at the eyes and have what fraction of a second they spend on which part of the label and so on. So you can actually, you have metrics to see uh, how they respond to it. What I'm showing you now is something that is fairly efficient. This is the existing energy label. Um, on your A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you have the energy efficiency performance. So this is something consumers know well. Some of them may say, I wash three times a year. I don't give a shit. Sorry for using that word. I would just buy something that is inefficient and I don't care. But a lot of them do care either for their conscientiousness reasons or for um, economic reasons. So they will respond to this. But what you don't see is that our eco design measure, which is not information based part, will have actually removed anything that performs below G. So there are washing machines in the world that, that perform well below G that you cannot sell in Europe because we see that all the consumer's needs can be sufficiently served with anything between G and A. And, and that's where we actually remove the consumer's not choice because the choice is still, it's, it's huge. They can buy very cheap machines. They can buy really expensive ones. But this is where the regulatory um, approach comes in um, that, that market incentives cannot do. So that's one bit. Second bit is if you look at the bottom part of the, of the label, you see selected number of additional information that are available to them. So you see how many loads can you, can you wash, you see how much water you need, you see how, what's the noise level. So I think this is the maximum we would go about information that is available to the consumer on one label. But what we could do um, is we could see in, in our analysis that would include also consumer surveys and all, all kinds of stuff that private companies would do. We could see that reparability scoring is very highly important in a product because it's a product that can be last lot, much longer if it is repairable. And then we could either add that separately or we find a space for it on a label. So this is a bit just to, to, to provide an example of something that's really concrete and already exists. And I hope it worked and now I hope it works in me getting it off your screens. Yes, uh, we hope so too. Just while you're trying to get it off, very quickly, a question has come in um, from Sarah DiMartini from CLASP. May you please ask if they aim, also aim to have those labels online? Uh, Matthias, do you know if they aim to have, yes. you want the labels online? Okay. Yes, Thank indeed. You. And actually, they would be probably scannable, so you get all sorts of information that you need. Um, um, either linked to a website or another form that's uh, digitally available. Okay, I want to go to Kyle and back to Sylvain for comments on the P on the questions that were raised as well by Peter. I said I would do that. Um, Kyle, I can't see you anywhere now because my match is just I've, did I've now blocked everybody. with his slide. Um, <laughs> uh, but Kyle, if you can. If you can see us, see me, and I hope we can see you. Do you want to comment Absolutely. on just what has been said? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is this is super important. I mean, we need to get to a point where it is as easy and seamless to repair a product that you have as it is to replace it and go and buy a new one. Uh, and and that, that's what's going to drive, you know, we got to get consumers the information and then we have to make it easy. And that, that requires an ecosystem. Repair requires an ecosystem. It's not any one of these things that's going to have an impact. The, the visibility of the label, the French sco uh, score, the repair score has to be right next to the price at retail. So that score is really helpful. Um, but then you also, you need a repair shop in your neighborhood that you can take things to. And in order for that repair shop to exist, they have to be able to get access to schematics and repair manuals. Um, so uh, it, it, this is, it, it's going to take a network system. And that's, that's why I think it's important that this is a, a global conversation. Uh, when, when France incentivizes manufacturers to make repair information available, uh, manufacturers put that information online, that's available to people in Indonesia and India and, and all around the world, if it's available on the internet. Uh, and so repair policy is really one of those areas because the information is so key to these repair shops being able to be successful. Uh, the the acts that, that France takes in the regulatory environment, even if it doesn't, you know, that legislation doesn't spread globally, globally, the information already is. And so that's where you have, you know, websites like iFixit, we're aggregating that information and making it available to those repairers. When I go and talk with uh, fixers and repair cafes in Ghana and I ask them, hey, how do you figure out how to fix things? They say, oh, we just Google it. <laughs> so if we can get the information onto Google, it will, it will, uh, I think that rising tide will lift all boats.
Okay, um, and just very quickly, Kyle, though, um, if you're going to have more repair people and, you know, all these repair shops around the place so we can take any multitude of devices to them to fix them, presumably there's going to be a cost. Who pays the repair person to fix our products? Is it us as consumers with the broken products or is it the uh, c company that originally produced them? I think it's perfectly fine to ex expect consumers to pay for it. And, it, and if, if you look at, I mean, the hope is that that it is far more uh, cost effective to, to, you know, you think about like if the windshield on your car breaks, I will happily pay to get that fixed rather than buy a new car. Uh, and, and when I pay that money, I'm, I'm funding local repairers. Uh, you, if you think about a smartphone, I've got my phone here. The, the labor cost to assemble this phone is maybe is maybe five dollars. You know, to to labor with Foxconn in China somewhere, where here in in California, if I'm paying someone to repair this, I might pay fifty dollars to a local laborer to repair it. Fifty dollars is a lot less than the six hundred dollars I paid for this device new, right? So I'm coming out ahead, and I'm also funding my local economy. Uh, and and if you look, Microsoft uh, uh, conducted a study look at the greenhouse gas impact of increased repair. Where they went from a model where they were doing a warranty type replacement, they're mailing product you know overseas to get refurbished to the factory, then mailing it back, versus hiring people local in the community to do the repairs, and they found there was an 82% greenhouse gas reduction. So we have an opportunity to create local jobs, benefit consumers. Um, it, it's just a win-win across the board. Okay. okay, Kyle, thanks a million. I see, Matt, as you have your hand raised, you wanted to comment on that just very quickly, please. Yeah, just very quickly, I think Kyle's points are all valid. The, the other thing is that things shouldn't break down as, as frequently as they do. So, for example, what we've done um, just now, we have a proposal that basically says, if you as a company claim that your thing will not break down in three, four, five years, you should put this out so the consumer can know. So that they don't just know that things is easy to repair, but they say, um, okay, if you claim this lasts four years, I'll buy it. But then as a company, you should also warranty it for five years. You can't just say this is going to last for five years and then you stick with your original one year warranty. So I, I just a compliment to, to what's a very valid point uh, by Kyle. OK, very quickly, I think a question for you, because you mentioned the digital the eco passport. But our Arnand wants to know, is is PEP eco passport mandatory? Would it be mandatory? Matches, is that a question for you? It's a question for me. If we would, um, we, we foresee that as a general rule, if we have a measure on a product, we would also require a digital product passport. But the extent of information, what would really be in this product passport, that depends really on the analysis of what's relevant for different players. Okay, thank you. Silva, I'm going to go back to you because actually Sarah wanted to know if the French re repairability score was going to be displayed online. And um, also a question in from Beatrice Pozo, Arcos. Is there any intention from the French legislators to have the similar add-ons to the French repairability index? It would be a good addition to avoid hidden compensation effects in the aggregated numbers. Silva, I don't know whether you want to comment specifically on those questions, but also on the broader points that were raised by Peter as well. And if you can do so in just a few minutes, that would be great. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, I believe that uh, indeed uh, companies, well, they, they are required to, as I said, to put the information as close uh, as possible to to the product at the time of purchase. But I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that most of them take also the opportunity to uh, put the repairability index uh, online. Uh, because uh, they are aware that um, this information on the repairability of their products is also good for their um, image. Um, then concerning some add-ons and some... Uh, yeah, we, we're already thinking of uh, improving uh, the repairability index and also possibly adding new criteria related to uh, durability, such as reliability, robustness, um, and um, to get back to um, Peter's uh, comments, um, I, I completely agree uh, that um, information is not uh, is not enough. But we we believe in a certain virtue of the information uh, instruments in this sort of uh, double dividend uh, that uh, 
is of course the first one uh, is uh, informing the, the consumers but also through uh, increased uh, transparency on the market um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, competition on uh, new types of uh, criteria such as repairability then to uh, to uh, and through competition to promote uh, eco design uh, so in this case for uh, better repairability, but it, of course it can be also other other criteria. Having said that, uh, completely agree that information is, is not enough. We really need a, a tool mix. Uh, that's why we are also putting in place some uh, incentives. Uh, we, we are going to launch uh, quite soon a repair fund in order to, uh, to make uh, repair more uh, affordable. Um, and uh, uh, eco-modulation has been uh, mentioned uh, in, uh, in the previous uh, panel. Uh, we've introduced uh, eco-modulation in several sectors uh, in France as well as, as an in incentive uh, for, um, for eco-design. Uh, there are several uh, support programs for, for companies as well on, on um, eco-design uh, in, in, in general and, and, and repair and so on. Uh, and we are counting, um, that's why I, I, I say um, a, a few words of support to the European Commission with their new proposal on the eco-design of uh, sustainable products, because we are counting on the uh, European uh, level. We can't, it's really difficult at national level to introduce uh, eco-design re requirements of, on, on, on products. And then we aim to also align our, our repairability index to the European one uh, when it's uh, developed. Okay. Thank okay. Thank you so much for that. I leave this segment with a very good comment from Apostol Penkov from Bulgaria. It says back in the 2000s, you could easily replace the battery of your mobile phone. Started by Apple and followed by the whole industry, all phones now don't have a lid in the back. Is that about to change? That might be a question we can maybe tackle in the next segment as well, but a very good point to raise, Apostol. Thank you for that. And a big, big thanks to our speakers um, for this segment, to Mattia, Silva, Kyle and Peter. Thank you so much for your very valuable contributions. We're now going to take a quick 10 minute break. Um, it's probably best you stay connected online. And after the break, we're going to have our second workshop. We're going to be looking at which forms of global cooperation can help drive circular design. We have some super guests again lined up to speak on this. And again, your input um, during that segment would be wonderful. So we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you.
So welcome back, everybody. And if you're just joining us, you're very, very welcome to this workshop on circular design. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I specialize in EU issues and along the way um, in amongst the politics and lots of other stuff in an EU context. I would also cover environmental issues and circular design as well. And it's been great really hearing some of the very interesting contributions from our speakers and getting your input as well. Now it's time for our final workshop discussion. And the theme of this one is which forms of global cooperation can help drive circular design. The objective of this session is to explore what kind of multilateral cooperation could help G20 members shape helpful policy to promote circular design or respond to it when it is applied to another G20 members. There are no correct answers to this. And so an open discussion of thoughts and ideas and individual requirements would be really welcome. We're going to start this workshop as we did for the previous one with individual presentations, and then we'll open it out to the floor. Please do submit your points and questions through the chat box as you have been doing. Um, I think you were shy the last time um, about contributing virtually and putting on your camera and video. Of course, you are very welcome to do that. We'd really love to hear from you. Um, and if you want to, when we come to the discussion part, participate with your video, then just let me know by uh, pressing the raised hand icon on your WebEx platform, and it should show up next to your name and we can go to you. So now um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this segment. Dr. Tim Schulz is a policy officer in the Unit for Electric Mobility, Battery Cell Production and Environmental in Innovation in the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Dr. Schulz deals with different issues around batteries for electric vehicles, including the battery passport. And he's now going to reflect on what would be necessary for a digital product passport to create value for every actor and country in the global supply chains. He'll also look at what opportunities this would bring for multilateral cooperation to add uh, values. Tim, you're very welcome. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Now I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. And also, thanks to the organizers for having me to give an impulse to this upcoming session. Number four on uh, global cooperation towards uh, circular design. Um, I'm going to have to ask the organizers, are the slides going to come up? Yes, they will. OK, uh, yeah, as you heard, my name is Tim Schulz. I'm a policy officer in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy uh, or Climate Action. Sorry for that. We just recently changed uh, the name of the ministry. Yes, Climate Action is in there now. Um, and yeah, please, uh, next slide can come up. Yes, so I'd like to take the example of batteries on which our unit in the ministry has been working for the past five years or so. Um, so we had mainly been pushing for a domestic uh, battery value chain in, in Europe, but sustainability has been and is a fundamental goal. Um, so batteries are relevant for many of the points raised today, in particular by Elisa and in her initial uh, a keynote uh, using the example of the electronics industry. So even though they are part of a key transformative uh, solution technology, I, I might call electric vehicles, uh, they are very resource intensive. Uh, thus, there is environmental and social impact by pollution, by potential usage of, of conflict minerals, by greenhouse gas emissions in, in the value chain and so on. So um, the main environmental and social impact comes indeed from uh, the materials value chain, the raw materials going in the batteries, the mining, refining, the production of active uh, materials, the cell production. So all the stages before they actually go in, into a car. So thus uh, circular design is key uh, for batteries towards uh, improving the environmental footprint. And this of course has aspects of, of hardware design, of battery product design. Uh, that would revert to many of the points discussed uh, uh, today so far. So I won't talk about this, but I would uh, rather like to talk about the system 
that needs to be built around batteries and electric cars to promote circularity. And I'd like to present briefly the battery passport uh, as a digital uh, concept towards promoting such circularity. And this is indeed a I would say a, 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 an example, a primary example of, of the digital product passports that have been discussed also in previous talks and touched upon by, by Matthias, for example. Um, so electric vehicles have reached a, a tipping point in, in many economies. Uh, they are seeing exp uh, exponential growth in their penetration in, uh, in, in transport markets. So we are going to see many batteries reaching their end of life uh, until the end of the decade. And we're talking here about millions of tons annually globally that will be uh, in reach in, in uh, just a few years to come. So. Um, these can only be reused and, and recycled if the responsible actors have basic information uh, on, for example, the battery composition, the metals that are in there, the, uh, the usage history uh, or the state of health as the, the technical term uh, to decide, for example, whether a battery needs to be scrapped or can be reused in a, in a second use scenario, for example, for stationary storage, uh, storage application, um, the presence of hazardous substances and so on. So how can we achieve this and, and make it interoperable? That's the, the basic question here. Uh, please, next slide. And uh, the, the prime uh, digital tool to achieve that is the battery passport. So this is a digital representation of the battery conveying all relevant information about ESG requirements, so environmental, social governance, but also and this is why it's, it says ESG plus here, uh, additional add on uh, information that is useful uh, for actors along the value chain um, based on a comp comprehensive definition of a sustainable battery. So the requirements themselves will, of course, be be based on, on relevant standards, laws, regulations that can have a, a local character. Um, but the, the battery passport itself itself is a generic tool. Um, which lends itself to uh, to to check compliance um, against those uh, standards, laws, and regulation. But uh, it, the itself should be it should have a generic nature in the sense that it uh, is applicable uh, to to all the the markets in, in the ideal case uh, around the globe. But this is of course a formidable challenge. Um, so you could say that the battery passport is a digital a digital twin of the physical battery enabled by a digital platform, which is yet to be defined and and formed. Please next slide. So uh, to to get more uh, hands on here, uh, this would be a picture of how such a passport uh, could look like in in terms of its its content. So. Uh, it, it could contain uh, labeling data, the manufacturer's name, battery type, model identifier, uh, things that the uh, that the battery producer puts in there, um, master data that that would uh, reflect the uh, the value chain stages uh, upstream that go in there, the chemistry, the hazardous substances, critical raw materials. Um, then uh, durability, performance data, and, and requirements checks, checked against uh, the relevant norms, um, operation requirements, and also dynamic data, which then can reflect the uh, the exact history of, of a particular uh, usage of, of a battery that might be useful to decide what, what's going to happen with this battery when it comes to its end of, of primary life. Please, next slide. Now, in, in a nutshell, that would be all relevant data for the actors along the value chain, uh, data to make informed decisions for second use versus recycling, uh, then the, the information needed for the recyclers to decide, for example, which process to run on a particular battery or if there's um, hazardous um, substances to be uh, to, to take care of. Of course, uh, information for regulators to check uh, compliance with applicable uh, local regulations, information for customers to uh, get uh, a, a certified knowledge about how green, for example, an electric vehicle is, to, to put it bluntly, and then also uh, data for auditors, for validators, which could also be NGOs, for example, that um, validate the uh, claims that 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 vendors uh, make uh, about compliance with certain standards 
So uh, this is a plethora of, of data. And of course, you could uh, think that all these, these different roles, these different actors uh, would probably need different access rights here. So uh, as much as I said in his presentation, the, the goal would, have, uh, would be to have a, a need to know a basis here to uh, decide who gets to see which information. Please, next slide. Now in Europe, um, there is a regulation on, on the battery uh, value chain upcoming. It's currently uh, discussed in the so-called trilogue between the Council, uh, the Commission, and the European Parliament. Um, it's not yet clear when it will be uh, when it will come into force, but uh, we hope that it's going to be soon. And uh, this indeed um, regulates aspects uh, across the entire um, life cycle of, of a battery from mining and processes to the end of life and, and recycling. And it also features the requirement of an electronic exchange system and also a digital passport from 2026 onwards. Next slide, please. So um, we can say right now that the battery passport will be one of the key pilot application uh, applications of digital product passports in general. The EU will have mandatory requirements from 2026 onwards. There's pilot projects towards the development and implementation of battery passports uh, ongoing on both uh, EU uh, global and, and national levels. Um, so the EU will will move ahead here. That's that's quite clear in terms of uh, of mandatory uh, regulatory requirements. Um, but of course, the battery value chain is a global one. And there's also other markets uh, where um, similar uh, mechanisms are being contemplated. There's a, a global battery alliance uh, from whom uh, one of the slides uh, comes that, that I've been showing uh, where the market actors together with NGOs um, are uh, uh, deriving concepts for, for the battery passport on a global level. So uh, in order to achieve compatibility between uh, potentially different requirements in different markets, there need to be a set of rules for the governance of the data that, uh, that, that needs to be ag agreed on globally. And, and this should comprise rules for data collection, for data ownership, for the standardization of data sets, and for the access to or the disclosure of, of data. So in a nutshell, even if we might have uh, different regulations um, uh, defining different set of rules to which uh, there need to be compliance in, in regional markets, uh, the ideal uh, picture would be to have a common set of rules for the exchange of data globally, because that would uh, essentially en enable a, a convergence um, uh, uh, along the, uh, the value chains where most of the actors are indeed global, global players and, and also uh, make it easier for uh, to adapt those standards, to raise the standards and across different markets. So please, uh, next slide. So I would say um, my, my answer to this question, which global cooperation can support national or regional policies for circular product design in the domain of, of battery passport would be that we need global cooperation on a data governance framework and to establish a level playing field regarding the collection, standardization and disclosure of data. And this is required to facilitate confidence and credibility in a data system for product passports and digital traceability systems in general uh, which will be crucial parts of a future circular product design. And, and we as the German government will, um, will take this uh, issue to, uh, to, to the global floor. We have uh, started with a European workshop uh, recently on, on data governance, uh, which will be followed up by regional workshops in uh, America, North America and, and Asia as well. And we also believe that the G20 would be uh, a very, very good forum to discuss these, these issues in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Tim. And uh, no doubt people will have questions for you. So if you do have questions for Tim, please fire them in through the chat box and we'll get to them a little bit later. So we'll come back to you a little bit later, Tim, to bring you back into the panel debate. Let's move on to our second speaker. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Wouter Shakers, uh, the Product Supply Director with PNG. He has a personal commitment to enable the development of the circular economy by using industry standards to drive value 
for companies and the planet. And Vuter will share now how brand owners, retailers and other stakeholders in the supply chain are partnering up to address the challenge of plastic sorting and to see what help is needed to accelerate the process. Vuter, I'm, I'm pronouncing it Vuter, but it may be Wouter, but you maybe can um, clarify the pronunciation of your name. You're very, very welcome. We're looking forward to seeing and hearing your presentation now. Thanks a lot, Karen. So it's Walter, but it was uh, pretty close. <laughs> Good job. So actually, I see that in, in WebEx, my name is a bit uh, critical. So sorry for that. I didn't realize it. But no, thanks a lot. It's my pleasure to, to join this session. I do not have any slides, but I will try to cover the story clear enough so you're all engaged and following till the end, right? So before already, there was Tim really giving a nice example of how the digital product passport comes to life. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer another use case that actually fits under the same umbrella, which is focused on sorting and recycling. And I hope it can offer a nice stimulus for uh, discussion afterwards. So just for those that don't really know Procter & Gamble as a company, we're active in fast moving consumer goods. So no brands on Ariel, Pantene, Oral-B, et cetera. And we have a clear objective for 100% recycled or reusable packaging by 2030, including also enabling actually actual recycling in homes and communities. And I, I hope after this testimonial, it gets a bit more clear on you know, how we're trying to do, to do, how we're trying to do that one and how the G20 community can help to accelerate exactly. Now let's take a step back and really get clear on what is the problem statements that we define for ourselves, right? So we talked already earlier in this session, or at least you talked about the importance of design for circularity in order for packaging to be recyclable, you know, by 2030 as per the Packaging Waste Directive. Now what I want to talk about today is not only about being recyclable, but also about what is needed to really close the loop and make sure the packages actually get recycled which may sound obvious, but it's a quite big difference in reality. So if you purely look at the recycling, honestly, that's the easy piece of the story because there are several recycling methods available, be it mechanical or chemical. One of the bigger problems we are actually facing in the value chain is the sorting itself, because we know that the better we sort, for example, different types of plastics, the better the recycled product will be, the higher the price, the more people are interested, etc. So sorting is really a bit of an unknown but an important one that we decided to focus on. And not just that we want to kind of focus on fixing the issue of sorting, we also want to do it in a way that we can really conclusively demonstrate with evidence that the loop is really closed, right? So not just say, look, theoretically it's possible, but really proof with data, and that's where the digital passport comes in, proof with data that a product is recyclable and recycled. Again, that's really the problem statement, the mission we're after. And how we defined kind of our mission on this one is that we said, look, we want to come up, we want to prove a solution that is all around granularity and traceability down to the SKU level, because we believe if we can do this one together with your support, we can really make a step change on circularity. So pretty much now we know what is the problem we're focusing on, what is the solution that we're working on, and I would say the set of solutions in fact, because as PNG, we're actively participating in several industry initiatives, using the design of our packages, be it in the use of invisible watermarking, be it in the use of artificial intelligence or several other ones. And again, we're not advocating for a legislation to be selective. We want it to be technology neutral. But just allow me to use one specific example, you know, that is a watermark initiatives. Some may know it already as a holy grail program. And I just want to use this initiative to illustrate the journey on what works and what doesn't work, as well as on the remaining challenges. Interestingly enough, I mean, we had a speaker before from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Also, this program was actually founded, I believe, around five years ago under that foundation, really as a multilateral cooperation of, oh, let's say, companies, so the industry, really trying to address that specific issue of sorting. And I would say we went through quite a big journey already. I will share some learnings today and some challenges, obviously, uh, for you to, to act upon. If you say, look, what is this watermarks thing about, right? So how does the solution look like? In the end, you could say is we are trying to transform our packaging in intelligent packaging. And so pretty much in this specific solution, we're adding a watermark code to the artwork. It's acceptable for the human eye, so the consumer will not see it. It can be recognized by a camera. So this means that if you, you know, after the use phase where the plastic bottles, for example, end up in the sorting and recycling facilities, 
the, the sorter is adding an extra piece of hardware and software next to the infrared module. It contains a camera. It recognizes the watermark that passes on the conveyor. It looks up in real time the corresponding packaging characteristics. So it will know it's a package from Procter & Gamble. It's made out of that film, etc. And based on that intelligence that is really identified through the packaging, it's the machine is able to split streams in two. And if you repeat that step several times, in the end, you're able to produce in a sorting site monomaterial bales of plastic that then be picked up by the recycler. And it, re and it really increases the recycling, let's say, the, the recycling quality, right? And again, that's one of the, the big challenges we're facing today. So what is the good news? I would say technically, again, this solution or any other similar solution, right, I mentioned before, technically we're pretty advanced. Yes, we still have things to learn. But just to give you an idea, we know already better and better how we can include these watermarks in a package. We have demonstrated with semi industrial tests already that these watermarks can actually be recognized on a high speed line and it can be sorted out down to the SKU. So you would say, what's stopping you, right? Let me highlight, I would say, two specific areas here. I would say the first area is data management. We have started a great partnership with GS1. For you that are less familiar with GS1, it's a global non-profit association that typically connects brand owners, retailers, and some other players in the industry. Every time we talk about industry standards, think about the barcode, but they are now also an active player on the digital product passport, for example. And we have really identified with them a few principles that are really successful. It's about being technology neutral and interoperable for a data management system. It's about making sure that the information is not captured and isolated and owned by somebody, but that the information is available for everybody in the value chain, at least, you know, with some constraints, obviously, for IP reasons, but at least everybody that needs it for sorting and recycling, they should be able to access the data they need. And we're, together with them, we're about to build a data management system that can support Holy Grail, but it can also support other use cases. So as, let's say, companies, right, we publish once our data and it can be used across different use cases. So in the end, you know, as I mentioned before, it nicely fits in the same framework uh, that Tim was talking about before on the digital product passport. It's all about being green and digital. It's all about, you know, making the digital twin for the physical product. If you do that in a smart way, this is really how we see the future developing. And pretty much the plea to this team would be say, look, we know these principles on how to, to make the data management system work. We really count on your support to really set and protect these principles in any upcoming legislation. So it doesn't become, you know, a chaos of different identifiers, et cetera, because as companies, that's really where the whole system would crack. And as said, right, in circularity, we need all players to, to partner upon that one. So let's say technically we're in good shape. If you then say, look, we know pretty well the solution to address the problem statement. Again, we know the mission, right? We want to sort it with granularity and traceability down to the SKU level. So what is the other help we need from, from this audience? I would say there is one help request and one more kind of suggestion to, as an opportunity to leverage the value even more. The first one on the help request, and actually it was mentioned a few times already before, there was a lot of documentation in the chat. It's all around EPR. Huh? So there is an existing framework with EPR fees, but if we can really you know, come up with a stronger uh, harmonized guidance across G20 on how you to do eco-modulation on that one with consistent price signals, that's really the foundation we need to make this work. Because today the EPR organizations, they're scattered, they're very fragmented, they're not even by country, they're by region. And as long as these guidances are not harmonized, you know, as a brand owner, we can put in whatever identifier in our package. If the, if the guidance is not consistent and if there is no clear incentive for companies to invest into it, it's going to be a very tough thing. So I think we all know what needs to happen on the eco-modulation. I'm very happy it was popped up uh, several times. This is really, I would say, the one big plea for help uh, towards the legislation to help us on that one. Because if we can install this kind of bonus malus principle, right, really where if you prove your design is good, but also that you can actually demonstrate with data that it's sorted and recycled. I think if you can really incentivize that one with a bonus as part of your EPR framework, this would be super, super powerful. And that's really the help we need. The other thing, again, is more of a suggestion on how to leverage on it. So as mentioned, 
we're creating actually a digital twin of the phys physical product, right? It's a digital product passport. So in the end, it comes with some new opportunities. And I just want to highlight one that is also kind of a very interesting one. So you know that today, if you purely look at the package, they're full of information, right? I mean, if you look at a consumer product, anyone, the labels are really full of information. And even though that's what the current leg legislation prescribes, you could argue that for the consumer, there is now so much information that is not useful anymore because it gets very confusing. So really what we are trying to, to let's say, suggest is to say, look, can we explore what has to be physically unpacked and what can be digitally available so we really have a, a, a better balance of what is really the minimum minimum that has to be on the pack and what can be available in the cloud through scanning a kind of code, be it the watermark or a 2D code, for example. And then, you know, the consumer can find everything they want within a bit more digital way than today. So pretty much, again, the technology exists to do that one. But what we're really asking this team to think about is how can we establish some standard principles on kind of full demetrialization or probably more partial demetrialization of label requirements. Again, if we are all thinking along and co-creating and maybe piloting and experimenting in this area, I'm quite sure we can really drive new value, again, using the same digital twin concept, using the concept of the digital product passport, leveraging the, 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 the digital watermarks, for example. So this is really, I think, the plea to this team. So let me just quickly recap before, you know, there is uh, the next speaker and then some questions. So. Our focus in circularity is really to crack the sorting step because we really believe this is one of the big things where we need to step change. We want to do it by offering granularity and traceability down to the SKU level, independent of the solution. And while we know how to do this technically right, we ask your support for G20 harmonized guidance on the EPR eco-modulation with the consistent price signals. And then to leverage the full value right, we ask you to establish these principles on partial demetrialization or label requirements. So again, I know it's a bit of a very condensed message, maybe too much information. If you have questions, feel free to drop it in the chat, but I hope at least it's been a good stimulus for your conversation and looking forward to some questions popping, popping up. Okay, well, yeah. Walter, thank you very much. You covered an awful lot there. I don't know how you did it without any slides or apparently uh, notes, but you know your topic very well, obviously. Thank you very much for that. I think there will be a lot of questions uh, for you and not least how how you get that um, harmonized guidance across the uh, G20 countries. Some of our representatives from other G20 countries might be willing to provide some opinions on that. Um, Wouter, so stay in the background. We'll come back to you once we get to our discussion part. We want to go now to our final speaker for this segment. And that is Nil Gwen Tass, the Deputy Director with the Department of Environment and Chief of the Industrial Resource Efficiency Division of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Uh, Nil Gwen will speak about what forms of multilateral cooperation on resource efficiency and circularity are available what work well or could be enhanced, and what could be relevant for discussions about policy for circular uh, design. Neil Gwen, you are very welcome. Um, as our final speaker for this workshop, I'll hand the virtual stage over to you now. Thank you, Karen. Uh, my name is Neil Gün Tash. Uh, I come from Turkey, it's a Turkish name. Uh, it's a bit difficult to be the last speaker uh, in such a rich environment uh, of the uh, this workshop. Um, but uh, I will start from the uh, easier uh, place by uh, suggesting that uh, for any uh, matter, uh, and for that matter for what circular economy is and what the role of design, circular design is within a circular economy, uh, we need a, a near almost a common and nearly universal language, including uh, about uh, what circularity is. Uh, Yesterday, I was uh, at least uh, partially listening into the textiles discussion. There was even there were even questions about what is the difference between sustainability and circularity. So, 
for for design uh, in to to focus on design circular design i i really like what uh joe said this morning uh in the beginning of the this workshop that everything is design indeed everything i just want to add everything is manufactured even the 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 the, the bag of beans that you pick up from the uh for nutrition from the supermarket which comes in a package because it's in a package and it's being graded uh based on the, probably maybe the size of the bean or uh, some kind of screening it's a it's a manufactured product it's a process product so everything is uh designed but design uh is a function that belongs to the producer or the manufacturer. So it has to make uh, sense uh, in a market. Consumers should buy it. It should be compliant with regulation. Uh, it should not require, or if it does, uh, significant investment to, to change the design. So probably the most difficult part of circularity a movement to circularity is in the upstream, in changing the designs. So it requires a, an ecosystem, not only at the local level, but also at the global level. Uh, one of these uh, now is an example of that. One of these global platforms where uh, governments uh, that are willing to work together on circularity, on just transitions to circular economy, have come together is in what we call the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency. <clears throat> this was started with uh, uh, the collaboration between the European Union, represented by the Commission, particularly our colleagues in the DG environment, UNEP and UNIDO, and currently uh, we are very happy to say that we have 15 country members plus the European uh, Union uh, and its member states uh, in the alliance. And uh, here, uh, the uh, these uh, the members, the willing governments, together with uh, supporters such as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, pace uh, uh, and uh, for example uh, like a couple of weeks ago two three weeks ago we conducted a workshop on circular economy and um, EPR uh, if Peter is here thank you Peter for the great collaboration uh, with OECD the, the these willing governments are looking into the different topics as it relates to circular economy to create both a shared experience, uh, a shared language, but not only that, uh, they are also uh, sharing information, exchanging information about what works, what does not work, how, what should be done, which policies are uh, uh, fiscal, whether they are uh, fiscal regulatory frameworks, which policies work best, uh, what are the barriers, how we can uh, or overcome these knowledge and governance gaps. Uh, is there any research that needs to be done? Can we take forward some sectoral, bilateral or regional partnerships, all with the objective of promoting just transitions to circular economies throughout the world uh, at multilateral platforms. Multilateral platforms such as the UN General Assembly, UNEA, UNIDO's General Conference, but not limited to that. For example, the, another multilateral platform is the G2020, and, and the very important one, G20, if it uh, decides and if it acts together, uh, could achieve a lot. 
towards uh, a, a transition to circularity, circular economy, and within that, of course, uh, also focused on, on circular design. So uh, uh, this is these kinds of platforms uh, should be sharing, should be looking into uh, successful pilots and uh, not so successful uh, experiences to learn from each other, and this could go a long way. Of course, uh, they can share their national policies and both create the universal language, uh, learn from each other in what businesses do in pre-competitive spaces like the different global alliances or uh, with, with very uh, much more uh, organized uh, uh, Councils like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development under sectors and so on. So these global initiatives could could help. Why we need the universal language to influence also circular designs? One has to understand that it is the companies, it's the firm that will make the design decision. Uh, and that design decision has to make sense with what I call the practices, whether it's uh, ease of uh, disassembly for repairs or for large, for higher value added products, it, whether it is the remanufacturability of a product, uh, depends all on design. But when you change the design, you might need to retool your manufacturing production operation. This is felt particularly important also for global value chains. Currently, uh, the most value chains are either regional or global, uh, and, and, and they are dealing with the products that possibly have the highest impact on and adverse impacts on uh, the environment uh, and and so on. So so it it the design decisions made by uh, buyers which come from the usually the consuming countries also imp will impact on the uh, requirements uh, that are expected from the producing countries. So. It is important to come together uh, in global platforms and in multilateral conversations on, uh, so that uh, these design changes that we wish and expect and want to do facilitate trade, but a better trade. They do not form uh, trade barriers. Uh, they, they achieve the objectives, the environmental and social objectives, as Elisa uh, indicated in the beginning. Uh, the health outcomes should be better and, uh, and, and really serve uh, uh, com com in a competitive world, in a competitive market, they serve the businesses as well. Because if nobody will change their designs unless there is mandatory regulation, and if in the absence of that, no one will change it uh, unless it, uh, it makes money. The, the, you, know, you would do not change any product design if you are going to lose money. You will maybe discard that product, change your business uh, activity, instead of you, you would not change uh, a design unless you are going to make money. That is, uh, and unless the uh, consumers are willing and able to pay for your product. So all of these elements have to come together, as Peter said, in market instruments, in taxation, in, in support instruments. So design, while very important, uh, have only maybe a few generic horizontal components, like make, using monomaterials, is uh, definitely will have uh, ease of recyclability. 
uh, creating modular designs uh, will help you in repairs, but not, not only that, uh, for higher value products in remanufacturing, where you take out one module, you put in another one. Uh, like uh, Kyle said today, uh, you ability to use simple tools, which is a part of the design, modularity, uh, the clips instead of the uh, instead of the screw, screws and whatnot will help you uh, will enable this assembly uh, the, 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 the digital tools that uh, colleagues have been talking about or remote sensing whether it's something some high high value machinery requires repairs or maintenance all of these. Uh, are, are very important for everyone to understand what it means to repair, what it means to refurbish, remanufacture, what enables recycling, so that these can be incorporated into the design. So global platforms like the CERE, like uh, PACE, uh, like uh, uh, regional platforms, and multilateral platforms such as the and the, uh, or re, uh, platforms such as the G20 are very important to promote circularity and what comes with it, uh, including in circular design. So I would like to end this part of my intervention by making a call to all G20 members to join Gasere. Uh, to, to join the conversation and, and to, to, to contribute to creating a common language, uh, a universal language around uh, circular economy and its elements, uh, one of which is circular design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil Gwen. And actually, that last uh, point you raised delves perfectly and dovetails perfectly into my plea to those from various ministries from G20 countries to please contribute your views on this call clearly made by all three of our experts. And actually, Tim, if you can come and join us as well, please. You know, Tim said, for example, we need data governance framework on a global level. Wouter talked about harmonized guide guidance as a grass G20 countries, very fragmented at the moment. And Ilgwen, you said over and over again, universal language need to come together. Very important point that you made that no one is going to change the design unless there's a mandatory requirement to do so. And they're certainly not going to change a design if they're going to lose money. So very, very clearly a need to come together. But what are the challenges to that? What's stopping that? Now, have we got somebody? Well, what I'd like to do is uh, yeah. if there's somebody from a ministry representing a G20 country, can you please, there's the somebody's thing? microphone is open. So can you please close the mic unless um, you are somebody representing one of the ministries? Now, if you can, in the participants box, if you can put your, raise your hand, if you would like to come on directly. And I would maybe, I might go to some of the ministries that I see here. I see we have, for example, Nina Shaw from the US, uh, James Butterworth. I'm not sure if you represent a ministry from the UK. Um, there are others. I believe we still have uh, Canada on board, France and Germany. So it would be great if you could put your input into the chat box. Let me know if you want to. Oh, happy to raise my hand. Nina, excellent. So Nina, can you unmute yourself can you put your camera on and let's say hello to you? There, oh, you there we go. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. Very good. Brilliant. That's terrific. I love the technology works. Okay, I well, know, you, right? <laughs> it's fantastic. So you are Nina. Just tell us very quickly who you are and who you represent. Sure. My name is Nina Shaw. I'm the acting director of the Resource Conservation and Sustainability Division, which is in the US Environmental Protection Agency. And Thank you so much uh, for this really engaging dialogue and thanks to the EU and the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce for holding such an important workshop on circular design. 
we found the conversation today to be very informative as well as quite frankly, inspirational. Creating circular design for products will require innovation, collaboration, standardization, and coordination from varying perspectives, including better sorting design for reuse, improved policies, targeted recovery technology, and brand buy-in and programs, all of which we share ideas and knowledge on under the G20 Resource Efficiency Dialogue. The United States is in the process of developing a series of strategies on building a circular economy for all, including strategies on plastics, electronics, and textiles. Through these strategies, we're working with stakeholders to identify and implement the key actions that are needed to make our material streams circular. We see that public procurement is a key component of what government can do to influence the design of products and applaud the broad range of efforts to leverage public procurement as a key driver and demand signal to ensure circularity of products. We also want to continue to encourage the innovation to make products more circular. We have a couple of interesting examples from the US. First okay, but Nina, I'm sorry. I'm not I wasn't aware you were going to make a presentation. Sorry, I want I, yeah. I the question that has been raised by our three speakers is very clear, loud and clear. There needs to be global cooperation on a number of different levels, whether it's data governance or whether it's design regulation across the G20 countries. The US is a member of the G20 uh, group. Yeah. What can be done to bring together that level of international cooperation to ensure there is a universal language as Neil Gwynn has just pointed out. Sure, I, you know, it's funny. I was just getting to that uh, point and that we do really find that the G source of uh, the G source, the G20 resource efficiency dialogue is really a key place to exchange the best practices and learning um, that has occurred as well as sort of a greater discussion on the different policies as we've had today. Um, I think that hearing and understanding what some of the challenges are, as well as learning from some of the practices that have happened in the past, um, whether they have worked or not, um, is really gonna be important. Uh, this is not a short-term um, issue that we're gonna solve overnight, as we know, uh, but we found this the G20 Resource Efficiency Dialogue to be helpful on collecting data so that we can ensure together to close that data gap um, and and really focus on circular economy indicators, which is something that we continue to discuss. Um, thank you. That's all that I wanted to say. And I think that's the sort of the response that we have to your question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Nina. Is there anybody else from the other G20 uh, countries, particularly a ministry who would like to comment on that. I mean, Tim, if I, while people may be uh, considering the response, how do you get that kind of cooperation across G20 countries? Tim, is it, what are the, well, is, before I ask you, is it actually possible to get that level of global cooperation on the design of products such as batteries in your case? Before you answer that question, first, what are the main challenges to getting that level of cooperation, do you think? Well, I mean, for me, it's hard to, to answer that in, in, in such a general way as, as you put the question. Uh, I think every every market uh, has has its own rules, um, set of, of stakeholders, uh, important players. Um, I mean, electric vehicles, uh, of course, the automotive industry is, is very well organized uh, globally. Uh, that that might uh, uh, make it easier to to agree there on, ter on 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 common terms because there's a genuine business interest um, to to have those rules, right? So, I think we are here um, in in a, in a rather good situation because there are global platforms. There is UNECE, for example, where global rules on uh, on, on on hardware are being 
being discussed and enacted uh, on, on a regular basis. This would be um, uh, an, an institution where, where such issues could be uh, could be fed into. Uh, then we have the Global Battery Alliance uh, formed under the World Economic Forum um, uh, five years ago already um, that, that has been or is dealing with those issues as well, also regarding the data space. So I think this is this is a rather good uh, starting point. There might be other industries where uh, where there, it's a lot harder. Um, then, of course, there is the um, the the question of um, how um, how homogeneous markets are in, in 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 a global in the global landscape. If if everyone also in a G20 context would have the same uh, vision and, and and goals there. Uh, yet again, I see for for batteries um, there that there is quite a a uniform um, a vision of uh, that, that sustainability needs to be increased here and 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 move forward because otherwise electric vehicles would just not be able to redeem on the central promise that they are a, a key solution technology for the climate crisis in the transport sector, right? So this this creates some uniformity of, of, of vision, I think, which we can leverage on in, in pushing this forward. But this might, might not hold true for, uh, for other parts of, uh, of industry, for, for other sectors. Okay, uh, Wouter, before I, I go back to our participants to see if they would um, like to give us their views, any any responses to that? The same question, really, that I put to Tim, to you. You know, what do you think um, are the main challenges to getting that level of co cooperation, and what would be maybe the consequences if it doesn't happen? We'll say, particularly from your sector. Well, I, I would say one of the challenges is what we call interoperable interoperability. You know, it's a difficult word. Even I can I can never pronounce it. But pretty much in the end, right, what we what we want is standards across the industry, while knowing that not every sector is the same, and it's a very tiny balance, honestly. So, for example, if you look at the digital product passport, I would say it's the same principle that covers pretty much anything, any kind of sector. So, I think the way I understood from the, the, the draft text of the legislation, it leaves room for differences by sector, which is in say a good thing. The $1 million question is how far can you go into that? Well, how detailed do you want to go by sector? Because if you go too different, then again, it becomes too, too different and there is no standard anymore. So again, the way we, we're trying to approach it from PNG is we're trying to co-create, you know, and say, look, we are active in several sectors ourselves. Let's learn, let's partner up and let's experiment a bit and let's see what works and what doesn't work. And then we hope that legislation will follow us, right, and kind of you know, learn as well, which is not obvious for legislation. I know that one, but that's, I would say, the, the, the big challenge we see. OK, I see that Peter Borke has his hand raised. And Nilgwen, I saw your hand raised earlier. Did you just want to make a brief comment? Then we'll go to Peter. Nilgwen, to you well, first. I, I just wanted to uh, inform the audience that ISO uh, has a technical committee which is nearing uh, a fruition on circular economy, where they uh, the committee has uh, identified uh, some definitions and has described as a global uh, standard, which comes to both the language, uh, common language, but also standardization of the understanding. Harmonization, standardization is very, very important. We are, as UNIDO, have been participating in that. And I also invite all the G20 countries to look at the drafts, which are for uh, up for public uh, consultation right now through their standards organizations. Because uh, while we are looking at harmonization at the global level, harmonization and collaboration at the national level is also very important, and standards organizations may be reaching out to the public sector, but they may not be reaching out to the relevant ministries, for example. So, so uh, collaboration from the national level, this cannot be done by ministries of environment only, or any other one single ministry at the national level. Similar is uh, important also, similar thinking is important at the global level, this is not an environmental problem. This is an economic problem, 
uh, an, an opportunity to transform our economies to be more sustainable. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Neil Gwen. Peter, uh, to you then, that sounds incredibly ambitious to be able to get that level of acceptance speaking the universal language that Nilgwen was talking about, not just on a global level, but it has to start at the local and then the national, regional, etc. Um, but you wanted to comment on, on that whole point about getting that level of cooperation. Yes, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to pick up on, on some of, of the comments that have been made uh, by, by, by some of the previous uh, speakers. Uh, relating to there being differences from, you know, from one sector to the next. I mean, <clears throat> let's just recall, I mean, when, when it comes to criteria for, you know, uh, more circular design, why does, why is some harmonization needed? Well, it's needed uh, to avoid that there are sort of uh, contradicting signals coming to companies which they then don't know what to do with. Uh, similarly, of course, in, in terms of information um, uh, and conveying information along, you know, value chains, it's important that that's standardized. Um, and I, I guess the point I wanted to make is, yes, you need international cooperation uh, to achieve that harmonization, but it may not always need to be done at the G20 level. I think the G20 level is, of course, uh, absolutely crucial when it comes to fully globalized industries such as, you know, automotive, uh, you know, the, the electronics sector, I guess, is another example. Um, but uh, just think of uh, food packaging. Uh, those markets are much more at the regional level. Probably it would be sufficient there to work, say, at, you know, in the big regional blocks, uh, the EU, Northern America. You know, um, you know, maybe Asia um, or, or some subset of Asian Asian countries, etc. So, <clears throat> I think uh, we need to have maybe a you know, if we want to define an agenda here for the G20, um, it, it's worth thinking a little bit along those lines and, and maybe prioritizing those industries or sectors um, that are you know fully globalized and, and have those those global value chains and and where products are also designed sort of for global markets and not differentiated regionally and, and just in terms of competitiveness and competition between different sectors but but different countries or whatever is it possible or is it a little bit utopian to expect you can get that level of harmonization and buy-in in, in the need to do these things when it may affect trade, may affect competitiveness between competing countries and blocks and trade blocks. Peter, to you again on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> no, for sure, there are challenges there on the way. Um, some, uh, you know, political economy, trade uh, issues may, may uh, you know, uh, constitute obstacles maybe to to reaching some kind of consensus sometimes. Um, but I mean, I think there are some really good examples of where this has been achieved uh, in the past. For instance, the automotive industry has a system of, uh, uh, you know, uh, data exchanges around, uh, you know, the material uh, uh, composition of, uh, of their vehicles. That, that is a global standard and they developed that. And I think, you know, one of the speakers, I think it was Walter uh, saying, you know, when there is, or maybe Tim, uh, you know, when, when, when there is a business interest, then there's usually also a way. And then, you know, at, at, at the level of the G20 or, or other international fora, you just need to channel the energy, uh, you know, in the best possible way. Okay, let's see. Uh, thank you, Peter. If we, um if we can entice more of the participants um, to engage with us, especially if you represent a ministry. Um, now, I wonder is our participant or participants from Japan, um, whether any one of you would like to participate here, engage with us, you can either do so through the chat, you can raise your hand and we'll go to in the video. I'm watching the two um, 
streams here, chat and participants, or um, let's see anybody from German ministry, French, uh, Sylvain actually, are you still there, Sylvain, from the Ministry of the Environment, French Ministry of the Environment? Um, if you are, maybe you might like to contribute uh, to this. I'm not sure if we've got any any um, individuals who want to, any volunteers to take this on at the moment. Um, Neil Gwynn, can I go back to you again on this issue? Same question I put to Peter. Is it possible? And I saw Wouter smiling when I m mentioned that as well. So I will go to you too, Wouter. Is it possible be again to get a level of of that level of cooperation on something so important as you know better designs of products, better reuse of plastic, better management of our waste when you may have competing trade interests? It's not in everybody's interests, perhaps, to buy into this. Uh, I, I will go with what Peter has already said. Uh, in some uh, industries where uh, there is the, you know, the concentration, automotive is one, batteries, how many producers there are of batteries, electric vehicle batteries right now, and how many we expect. So in concentrated industries, and higher tech, higher value of product producing industries. For instance, uh, we had uh, Philips uh, this morning, healthcare MRI machines, right? Maybe there are thousands uh, and hundreds, thousands of MRI machines around, but it's not millions of, uh, uh, so, so in some industries, there are industry standards already. And so these industries already engage the uh, the healthcare, the high value products, MRI machines are, I don't think they are really brand new. They are all mostly remanufactured by the uh, original equipment manufacturer because it is such a high value machine. Similar is caterpillars, the, the off-road heavy, heavy machinery or to look at the airplane engines, right? Some industries have these standards. Uh, they do circularity, they circulate these high value products and then going into the materials even, they also recoup the materials from the waste. So these, some of these industries don't really have waste. They take back because it's so valuable the uh, product. Okay. Okay. So it's possible. Okay. But what I said about harmonization is about our understanding the language. What does it mean to circulate and what are these practices that we are talking mean? And, and this is really simple because Basri this morning explained how Indonesia had, uh, you know, circular practices 55 or more years ago. So we have to have this really universal understanding of what these practices means, because they will never become business models unless a firm finds it will improve its competitiveness. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, now we have Taki Ito, from Japan, um, who, oh, it's Alaska, I think, from the Ministry of the Environment in Japan. Very, very good. Alaska, thank you very much for agreeing to participate. Now, can you just, can we just test the mic? Can you hear us and see us okay? Yes, I can hear you very well, and I hope you can hear me very well as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to uh, discuss about the product design issues, which is very essential for the uh, transition to a circular economy. As we have been discussing, uh, the involvement of uh, industries are very important. I totally agree with that. But the approach we did in Japan is uh, kind of a step-by-step -step approach. First, we had an intensive discussion with industries and all stakeholders to develop a new law on plastic resource circulation. 
So that was a, a holistic discussions to reach uh, the same uh, common, uh, same uh, goal to uh, promote circulation of uh, plastics. After the development of the, this act, we had some another intensive discussion on the development of the guidelines for the design for the environment for plastics. So we through this step-by-step uh, -step, uh, discussions, we started with the holistic discussions, and now we moved into some more breakdown discussions, specifically targeted on the product design issues. So such kind of uh, different stages, discussions in the different stages, I think we, what's very helpful in Japan to reach the common uh, understanding and the common methodologies, how we move forward with the uh, uh, promotion of the circular economies. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay. No, that's very interesting. And then how do you take that level, obviously, a very deep and granular uh, cooperation and consultation that you've done in Japan to the wider planet world to, we'll say, the G20 platform then? How do you take something that appears to be working well to a wider community? Thank you very much. I think sharing the experiences would be a good starting point to disseminate in the G20. So as we know that G20 covers a majority of the economies and populations, and I think the sharing of uh, policies, targets, indicators, and good practices are very important. In that view, Japan is working with other G20 members to develop a portal site, which uh, includes targets, indicators, and good practices by uh, G20 members. This portal will be launched soon. I, we are uh, aiming to launch uh, this portal site, website, by the end of uh, July this month. So that uh, everybody can have a look at it and, and see and learn from other countries' experiences. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you so much for that. Maybe you can put the details of that portal site into the chat box as well, Alaska, so people can get it. Thank you very much for your intervention. We just only have a couple of minutes left. Wouter, um, maybe you want to come back. Oh, does uh, Taki Ito want to talk to me as well from? Uh, Japan. I'm not sure. Um, if any of you participants who would like just in the final minutes to speak directly, please just indicate in the chat box that you would like uh, to talk to us. Uh, Wouter, your, your views on, on what has been said, perhaps, um, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I agree totally with Nilgun saying that it's not so much about sustainability anymore as a standalone strategy, but it became very much an economical question, right? And I think that's really the big difference versus a few years ago, that when you look at competitors, right, people saw sustainability as a separate strategy, and then indeed it becomes very tricky to collaborate. Now we all reached a point, I think, where we realize it's no longer a question if we want to play, but only how we want to play, because if you... If you're not making progress simply, you know, it will become very visible to the consumer. It is already very visible, rightfully so. So I don't think competitiveness is, is, is a barrier in this case. Yes, it's, it remains, you know, you have to be cautious of what you can share and not share. Obviously, you need to respect the rules. But I do think companies really want to partner up. We want to learn together. You know, we need to learn in some countries like Alaska said, yes, you need to learn in a country, but then we really, really need to scale it up at one moment in time beyond the best practice because otherwise it will not be economical and then we go back to the beginning right so i do think the g20 needs to play their role in that area to gather the best practices but then at one moment in time make a decision because without a decision there is not going to be scale and without scale there is no economical benefits unfortunately so that's a bit my plea maybe back uh, Okay, well, that's a, a very good plea to leave this discussion on. I think uh, we have just come to the end of our time for it, but a big, big thanks to Tim Wouter and to Neil Gwen for your very valuable um, insights and contributions, and indeed to those of you who also contributed to us online. And um, we've discussed an awful lot of things over the last uh, couple of hours, but it is time to come to our conclusions and to 
close today's workshop. Um, so Wooter Nilgwen and Tim, I'll say goodbye to you all. And now I'd like to go back to our um, closing speakers. And I'd like to call on first um, Luca Marmel, whom we heard from earlier today, the a senior expert on external relations and G7, G20 coordinator at the Environment Director General of the European Commission. Luca, I hope uh, you can see us and hear us. You're very welcome if you are able to join us. Is Luca there? Yes. Oh. Ah, very good. There you are. Good, Luca. I will hand over to you for uh, some conclusions before we also go to our Kadim representative. Over to you now. I see that I have my, uh, okay, the background uh, of, uh, voila, of uh, the previous, uh, the previous meeting, uh, G20, by the way, discussing the communique. So, um, uh, thanks a lot, Karen, and uh, to all of you. I think there was a rich discussion today that has confirmed that the circular economy is a strong approach to transform uh, uh, challenges into opportunities and uh, move away from unsustainable consumption and production and design being a key aspect of, of all this. And um, so some of the uh, statement comments, uh, uh, elements that have been provided by, by colleagues, uh, Elisa, Elisa Tonda from, from UNEP uh, was recalled uh, uh, that uh, plastic waste is on course to triple by 2040 and less than 10% is recycled globally. With all the impact that this has on the environment, on the health of people, uh, so redesigning products and considering alternative materials is uh, a possible way forward to address that. Uh, Kyle from iFixit made a very funny example of uh, uh, a certain brand uh, earbuds uh, that have the battery inbuilt. So if you want, when the battery ex end their life, you have to throw away the whole thing and buy a new one. And he compared that to, to a car with the uh, wheels uh, wielded to it. So if you, when the, when the wheels wear out, you have to throw away the car. Clearly, that is not a sustainable uh, way, uh, uh, neither for the car nor for the earbuds. Uh, certainly, the materials involved uh, are much smaller in the case of earbuds, but it's just the concept that would need to be to be improved. And uh, uh, also, the importance of of changing market demand and uh, Amazon, in order to meet that net, net zero commitment, uh, is driver for for improving the design of their product and processes uh, uh, in their in their business uh, ian leonard uh, at philips uh, uh, says that policy frameworks are needed to provide the conditions to shift business models that will reward circular products and so improving the design in firms it has to be in a way a partnership between regulators and the industry that can uh, improve the market conditions. And so more aligned the policies are, the more power the industry has to shift the market. And, and there are examples uh, of this alignment. Uh, for example, the adoption of uh, policies on the exclusion of hazardous substances in the context of Europe uh, is the ROS directive. Uh, but other countries of the world are also applying this type of approach. And uh, I think uh, a number of, uh, of those who intervened today uh, underlined uh, the importance that uh, the current uh, starting negotiations uh, on a legally binding agreement uh, on uh, uh, pollution, on plastic pollution, uh, be it in the marine environment, be it in the terrestrial environment, as a way forward to drive progress uh, around the plastics uh, uh, and one of the objectives of the EU has, all, all, has been all along in moving, uh, uh, in, in making uh, what is now a linear uh, production and consumption system for plastics a more circular one. And we see the global agreement on plastic uh, that is being negotiated as a way in that direction. 
also example from uh, various countries uh, we had from uh, from the european union from from france for the us uh, from from japan yesterday as well our japanese colleagues presented uh, their work on on, on textiles so uh, rich discussions around this but of course the, the the question particularly in the second part in the later part of uh, today's uh, exchanges has been uh, what next and what next could be done at g20 level uh, nina from from the us cba uh, mentioned the g20 resource efficiency dialogue uh, which is uh, uh, the context in which uh, uh, we have wanted to organize this workshop today as a contribution to the G20 roadmap, uh, the G20 resource efficiency dialogue roadmap, which has uh, specific elements around uh, uh, circular design, uh, which we have tackled today. Yesterday, we tackled the textiles. There are other aspects. Um, and we could go further in our exchanges uh, in terms of facilitating standards on product information for circularity or tracking and traceability where need for multilateral cooperation has been highlighted both yesterday today and i have to say is also part of uh, considerations uh, beyond the g20 because uh, the idea of looking at the product design and that uh, uh, transfer transferring information along the value chain is also part uh, of uh, the resolution uh, on enhancing circular economy in support of sustainable consumption production that was adopted in March this year by the United Nations Environment Assembly. So the Assembly of the Environment Ministers of the world has given indications and invitations to uh, UN member states to move uh, in, in this direction. Now, we are also moving uh, in the direction of Bali uh, in Indonesia, where on the 31st of August, there will be the G20 Environment and Climate uh, Ministers meeting. And we hope that uh, what we've been discussing uh, here today uh, will be a contribution to uh, aspects in the communique that is being negotiated around resource efficiency and, and circular economy. Now, with this, uh, I'll give the floor back to, to Karen, um, just to say that uh, we will uh, ask permission from uh, speakers to upload their presentations uh, on the European Commission website. And then uh, we will prepare a summary report of today's uh, discussion that we will also post and then share with all participants today. So thank you to all. I cannot say safe journey back because uh, I think you're all either at the office or in your homes, but uh, uh, see you in another occasion around these topics. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. And we'll go to our final um speaker to say some concluding words basri kamba whom we saw earlier the chair of the waste management and circularity committee at Cadeen. basri over to you thank you karen it's a bit like evening in jakarta now but this is a rich very informative quite updated and inspiring workshop so thank you again for the speakers lots of passports standards and requirements entering the global markets in the next few years. Uh, serious challenges for developing and mid-income countries that are rich with raw materials, major upstream players like Indonesia. So as uh, Nigel said, it may affect competitions and may affect interest or maybe not. But the presentation, questions and comments have slightly provided better understands how important the design of products is for achieving waste management, circularity, and our commitments to climate and environment goals. For example, Indonesia's waste management roadmap and strategy to reduce the flow of plastics waste into the oceans. But for businesses like us, like the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Indonesia, we should 
from now to think on how to redesign our products and production process to use fewer or different uh, resources in the production. That is particularly important where extended producer responsibility policy passes the cost of the necessary waste management to producers, as we heard from the speakers. And what we have heard more today about the crucial role of good policy in shaping incentives and providing support for circular design of products so that better design is economically rewarded. Because without benefits, business will not do that. The role of government in understanding design and putting in place policy is of course paramount, essential. Business has a role to shape that policy. Kadin asked the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and all its 12,000 business members are very keen to collaborate with the B20 like-minded private sectors to explore potential eco-design businesses and projects. Especially to my friends at the EU, Kadin is keen to build on our cooperations in these workshops to, uh, to follow up the output of yesterday and today's workshop for concrete and workable circular economy initiatives, especially the establishment of Indonesia Circular Hub. Better to have one concrete action through multi-stakeholders approach rather than having 100 initiatives or maybe thousands, but then keep on the shelves. Funding is of course significant, but keeping the hub, the circular hub up and running later is a challenge itself that we need to calculate from the very beginning. Cooperations between the G20 nations, 85% of the global economy, is the way forward. I, walk, I welcome the workshops in support of the G20 Resource Efficiency Dialogue within the context of the Indonesian G20 discussions. Learning from the other countries like Japan, government should be the leading player in this initiative by exchanging with each other on the base ways to provide guidance and incentives. Together with the government, CADI needs to build the infrastructure and the ecosystem here in Indonesia because uh, embodying circular economy is not about changing just one company or one sector, but must involve wider parties in the supply chain. I hope this workshop has begun and stimulates these cooperations. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Basri, for that. And that's it, really. I just like to say a big thanks to our hosts for today's workshop, the EU and the Indonesian Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry. A big thanks, of course, to all of the team who work so hard behind the scenes to put the last two days of these workshops together and to ensure that technically and from a content wise uh, production system they worked so smoothly well done to you all there are too many of you to name but you did a fantastic uh, job and of course thanks to all of you for participating online for engaging with us for giving us your input and your views for staying with us for the day it really was great to have so many of you here i hope you found the workshops inspiring and productive it was my pleasure to facilitate so many rich discussions and interactions throughout the day. So I will now formally close this workshop. I wish you all well with your efforts to enhance the circular economy, and I hope to see you again soon. With that, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you and goodbye.